This meeting is now being recorded. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. Um, Sydney here. Very pleased to welcome everybody on behalf of the range of um, partners that we have um, kind of putting together this meeting today from the USAID um, and, and, and URC Trans Research into Action Program, um, CDC, as well as our colleagues at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and so I think, as, as most of you know here, we're going to keep the introductory comments really very brief because we wanted to spend more time having all of the um, investigators actually sharing their research results. Um, but we, we are, we're very clear that really in order to demonstrate the wide benefits we'd like to see associated with scaling up of clean cook stoves and fields, that achieving uptake and sustained use is really very essential. Um, so today we're actually here to share some of the emerging results coming out of several of the studies that are supported by the Alliance, USCID, Traction, CDC, and EPA, which really illuminate some of the key considerations that we need to consider for program implementation in order to really maximize um, adoption and, and particularly to be able to, to move towards ensuring public health benefits. So you can see here actually um, the core of these studies, kind of the core studies that are going to be discussed at, at, in, in the beginning, are really the studies that were funded out of the request for applications that put out last year in collaboration with, um, again, with USAID um, and, 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 and URC. Um, and we're really pleased that actually um, in addition to the original kind of partners here that um, CDC via the Public Health Institute also provided support for additional study so that um, out of, out of the, the many studies, that, that the many proposals that we received, we were actually able to support four studies in total. Um, and really the, the, the purpose here, I think, you know, I've already kind of uh, discussed, really looking at the key determinants of really influencing the sustained, correct, consistent, and um, as, as far as possible exclusive use of demonstrably clean cook stoves and fields. Um, so really want to be very clear that when we're talking about clean here and, and focusing on clean for health, in order to be eligible, um, the proposals had to um, be focused on, on a technology that was at least tier three for indoor emissions um, verified by third party. We're also really interested in focusing on vulnerable populations, um, scale up that was used, uh, that, that was done via market-based or humanitarian approach, and really kind of existing efforts to scale up access to clean cooking. Because with the short time frame, we wanted to be able to really focus on places where things were already being taken to scale. So just briefly, I think because we're on a webinar, um, those of you who are not in the room here, um, so that you can kind of get a sense of who you're going to be hearing. Um, the initial four studies we'll be hearing about um, from the University of North Carolina, um, Pam Jagger, um, from Quintamba Health Research Center, um, Katie Asante, and then Darby Jack from Columbia University, um, from the University of, of California, San Francisco, and, actually, and also from the University of Del Valle in Guatemala. Um, we have Lisa Thompson and um, also Anaita Diazari. Anaita, we don't have your photos here. Um, and then from the University of Liverpool, um, the Cameroon Project led by, by Daniel Pope. Um, and then after we talk about these initial um, four studies, we're also going to be getting some insights. Um, one from the Welcome Trust China Energy Research Program that Jill Baumgartner from McGill University will be sharing with us. And then also several colleagues from EPA's STAR grant will also be talking about their work in progress. And, and that's going to be moderated by Terry Keating from EPA. So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce the first speaker, who is going to be Pam Jagger from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, who is going to be talking um, with us about their work to evaluate the Inyanyeri model in Rwanda. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'll start with today is a little bit of uh, just background context on uh, what the situation is in Rwanda. So, um, okay, very high uh, burden of disease associated with household air pollution in Rwanda, much like many other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
We also have very, very heavy reliance on biomass for cooking, and it's it's thing and challenging given what are also extremely high rate of forestation and very high population density. So Rwanda is the population dense country in Africa and really facing challenges of high level biomass. There are relatively thin or even missing markets for modern fuels and improved technologies. Um, although this is also changing due to some fairly aggressive policies that the government of Rwanda is supporting. We have, of course, in, like in many other settings, women and children bearing the majority of the health burden. And I just want to point out that um, despite the challenges and the development, there are some fairly innovative things going on in the country, including government of Rwanda support for a cook stove initiative that many of you will be familiar with the Del Agua Plum, which has um, had very strong support from the government of Rwanda. There's also support for the sale and distribution of the Kanarumwe stove, which is a, an improved wood-burning clay stove. And then some private sector uh, support, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is, is the private initiative that has been um, development and underway in the northwestern part of the country for four or five years. And then just to point out, like many other places, we have a relatively weak evidence base, although growing, of course, due to all of the research that's going on. Um, so what we're trying to do is to contribute to that. The, the private sector firm or invention that I'll talk about is called Inunieri, and the business model that they have is to couple a, a, a gasifier stove called the Mimimoto with renewable, renewable um, biomass fuel pellets, and the pellets are produced in a factory on the shores of Chu. So the idea is that the combination of this Tier 4 gasifying stoves and the sustainably produced mass fuel pellets can, under certain conditions, actually radically reduce the exposure to household air pollution. The business model that Ingenieri has developed is very much like a sort of American cellular phone contract. So the idea is that you would sign up uh, for a year's worth of participation in the enterprise and pay a small or modest initiation fee and then make a selection about what package you would like. And the package is predicated upon the quantity of pellets that you think that you will use within your household. When you sign up to commit to purchasing the pellets on a monthly basis, the firm then leases, effectively leases the Mimimoto stove to your household for the duration of the time that you are attracted. So it really is very analogous to a sort of cell phone act. Um, depending on the volume of pellets that you sign up for, you get either one, two, or three stoves in your household. And this is um, really quite salient in, in the part of Rwanda that we're working in, where many kitchens have um, what are sort of interesting almost countertop based setups where they have often two or three clay or two or three charcoal burning stoves uh, all in a row. So this idea of having three improved stoves that would replace the existing or baseline technology is, is really appropriate. Um, there's a lot of customer service orient orientation around the model. So there's free delivery of pellets. There's a very, a very high level of training and uh, interaction between the customer service representatives and households that participate in the program. Um, if there's a problem with a stove, it is repaired or replaced very, very quickly. So it's a, it's a very high level of customer service and support that's being provided to the people that sign up for the program. The, on the pellet side of things, the feedstock for the pellet uh, is primarily generated at this time through a sort of innovative model where rural households that are collecting biomass anyway bring the feedstock to a series of depots that they've set up, and rural households 
can exchange feedstock for pellets, but the idea is that there's enough feedstock coming into the, the system that the, the feedstock can in turn be used to produce pellets for the urban market and sold. So there's this sort of um, internal sustainability that's built into the design of the program. In terms of marketing, the way that Indianeary has operated is to use a variety of, of marketing messages. So this includes um, radio programs and billboards that are trying to get the word out about this new stove. They hold village level cooking demonstrations, so getting together uh, water the people and showing them what the stove and the pellet combination can achieve. They also go door to door in a sort of old fashioned way, knocking on people's doors and asking them if they can, asking what they can to them more about the stove and give them a demonstration. And then a relatively high level of support on the contract signing end of things because of course this is a little bit um, culturally out of context to have this sort of contractual agreement. So there's a lot of support given on that, and then really uh, extensive follow-up from the customer service representatives to answer questions, check on the, the stove maintenance, et cetera. So now I'll turn to talking about the study design. We are currently about uh, halfway through implementing a household-level randomized control trial that involves two cells, which is um, an administrative unit and 22 villages or umudugudus that have been purposefully selected um, from within the sort of marketing catchment area of Inunyeri. What we've done is randomize the approximately 20 hundred households that are in the study area, selecting close to 15 hundred to participate in the study. Those households were then randomly assigned to treatment and control with the um, understanding that the control group would have an opportunity uh, to have sort of reduced cost access to the stoves and pellets when our study is finished. We also have a smaller subsample of 180 households that we've been tracking um, at smaller intervals and undertaking um, much more intensive analysis of how they're interacting with the company and what the impacts are of participation in the stove program. We have then again, within that subsample, a smaller subsample where we've done qualitative interviews uh, with both household decision makers and then the primary cooks in the household. So where we're at now, uh, we collected our baseline data in July and August of 2015. We're planning an end line survey for um, a year to 18 months from now, and then we have had a series series of um, smaller uh, days and activities going on at shorter intervals. There's a very large and extensive household survey that has a, a significant health component. Uh, we're doing exposure monitoring of carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, and then monitoring stove use as well. So there's a lot of, of different activities going on in the field. Okay, so now what I want to do is turn to some of our early findings on, on what we're discovering in the field. So we have gone and uh, interviewed households after the marketing has taken place, and what we've learned is that about 85% of households in our treatment group have heard of Inunieri. They're you know, through various channels, the, either the billboards or of it by the customer service representative. Within our school, we have 24% of households that have signed the contract with Indianary. So from our perspective, the take up at this time is still relatively low. We would like to see it quite a bit higher. Um, what we're finding in terms of the share of cooking that's going on in the household is that there's a very high level of stove stacking among households that have taken up the stove. Um, and in investigation of our exposure monitoring and stove use data, what we're seeing is that the, the Mimimoto and the pellet combination is often second or third 
uh, priority stove in the household. So people are still really relying on charcoal stoves at this time, um, even though they have chosen to adopt. Uh, and I should I should mention that the, the charcoal stoves, this is a peri-urban setting, and uh, charcoal is the baseline fuel in the area, and people are using the sort of typical um, improved GECO type stove for the most part. Um, so what we have in terms of, of thinking about how much people are actually using the stove, we've got stove use monitor data that I won't present here today. We're still working through um, those data. But we did ask people in, a, in the context of very short recall stove and fuels they used over the past three days for each of the meals that they cooked. And you can see from figures two and three on this slide <laughs> that charcoal is still really uh, dominating the story. It's still, you know, even among households that have adopted the Mimimoto and the pellet combination, there's still a very, a very heavy reliance on baseline technologies. We have some uh, striking differences between people that have signed and people that have not signed the contract. We see that households that are sort of um, would typically be characterized as very stable sort of family household units. So, so married households are much more likely to have signed the contract. Uh, households where people are separated or single are less likely to have signed contracts. We have households with higher expend, uh, overall expenditures, so they have more money to spend in general, are much more likely to have signed contracts, and then um, their school expenditures are, are a bit higher, are also more likely to have signed contracts. The other interesting finding we have here is that um, households with a higher level of awareness uh, or level of awareness as articulated through exp household expenditures on hygiene and education are, almost, are also more likely to have signed contracts. So I don't think any of these findings are surprising, but sort of validating the fact that, that it is the demographic people that are able to engage in this type of marketing mechanism. So turning to the factors that are influencing take up and usage of the stove. So these are some uh, preliminary findings from both our quantitative and qualitative analyses. Um, the things that people really like about the stove are, for example, uh, speed of cooking. It cooks very quickly, and they like that. It also is a detriment in some cases. Rice is a, a commonly cooked staple in that part of Rwanda, and so it takes a little bit of learning to um, figure out how to use the stove to cook rice. People indicated that it does produce less smoke. And there was also a very um, sort of noted interest in the status and the sort of uh, aesthetic that the stove brings to people's households and kitchens. In terms of the biomass pellets, they like the cleanliness of pellets. You know, for people that are used to using charcoal, pellets are quite a bit uh, cleaner just in terms of handling and the impact that they have on cooking pots, for example. Uh, people also like the speed of cooking associated with the pellets, and they appreciate the cost as well. Um, so the, the, the pellets are costed at a, a level that's slightly below the price of charcoal, so people are able to understand and appreciate that. In terms of our qualitative analyses, we had feedback from people that they like that the Mimimoto is clean burning, that it doesn't blacken pots. There's some um, expression that people feel that it's better for the environment. And it's one that people have very high awareness of environmental issues. And then a, an articulation that this just this issue of the messiness of the charcoal is, is taken care of with this. Um, so you know, these results really mirror what we found with the quantity uh, analysis, that it cooks fast and cheaper. People also really like the customer service aspect of being engaged with Indianary. I think it makes them feel very happy that someone is coming to their household and talking to them about cooking, and they, they seem to be very um, embracing that in a good way. 
So interestingly, we see, so the green bars are the folks who have um, signed up for the contract. And when we look at the value of fuel purchased, purchased in the past 30 days, we actually see that households are spending in aggregate more on fuel than they are, than the comparison group of households. So this is sort of an interesting finding, and we are speculating that this that perhaps people are cooking more than they would otherwise um, because they have this new technology in the household. Um, among the non-adopters, I think an interesting finding and something that we're talking about with Inyanyeri about is that liquidity constraints seem to be a, a pretty serious issue. So people are a lot of people are expressing an interest in signing up for the program, but it requires them to pay the small sign-up fee and then also for the month, the first month's worth of pellets at the time of sign-up. And for people who are used to buying charcoal in sort of you know, two or three times a week in these little tiny uh, quantities, it's quite a big leap to think about your, your month's worth of fuel expenditure um, all at the same time. So we're, we're talking with Inyanyeri about you know, a particular issue and then you know, thinking, trying to think through some strategies for mitigating that. Um, in terms of the supply chain, so, you know, the, the firm has really worked very hard on government relations, and as a result of that, has been able to keep a fairly stable and constant supply of cook stoves in the country. They're all imported and um, uh, sort of waiting for stoves has never been an issue with respect to the study. I should note that the, the company started out with a fillet stove and due to lack of responsiveness from Philips about modifications that they wanted made and you know customer feedback that was going to Philips and, and sort of non-reactivity, they looked around for another stove. Now, as I mentioned, they're using the Mimimoto, and there's been a very high level of interaction between the company, between Inyanyeri and Mimimoto, and Mimimoto's been highly responsive and made a lot of modifications. And I think that this is, you know, this is very positive and something that's absolutely necessary to sort of keep this all moving forward. Storing the pellets is a little bit less um, favorable. So this, it turns out, has been a very major bottleneck to scaling up the entire business operation. Um, there's been lots of challenges. You know, everything is harder in Africa. So. They've uh, built a pelletizing factory on the shores of Lake Kivu, which is a major achievement in and of itself. But then thinking about, you know, uh, constant supply of feedstock, issues related to humidity and heavy rainfall, uh, power supply, you know, this is a constant problem. They need electricity to run the factory, et cetera. <laughs> um, and then maintenance, repair of equipment. It, this has just been a really a very big challenge for the firm, and so you know, sort of, it constantly uh, weighs on them and is occupying a lot of time. Um, so, just a little bit on the barriers. So, uh, one of the interesting things is that some of the things are uh, characteristics that people really that people are frustrated by. So some people are telling us that the stove produces more smoke, and of course that's partially a function of how it's being used, right? There's quite a bit of um, influence of the user activity on the amount of smoke that it produces. We also had people expressing concern about the cost of fuel, and part of this is related to people uh, really cranking up the stove and going through more pellets than they need to. So there's a sort of learning uh, period where people need to establish what they can do with the pellets that they have. Uh, we had people that indicated that the stove produced more smoke, or the pellets produced more smoke. Again, the cost of the pellets were an issue. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of these qualitative findings I've already mentioned, the Minimoto cooking too fast, we've got issues with um, food being burned, and this is particularly a problem with rice. Uh, some stories of pellets getting damaged by uh, water or moisture and also overhandling. Apparently kids, children, like to 
infant children like to run their hands through a, a bucket full of pellets, which causes them to sort of uh, fall apart. And then some concern about the, the pots turning black, burning holes. Okay, so just in conclusion, here are some of our unanswered questions. So one of the big questions in our mind from the perspective of this study is what would things look like in the absence of this pellet constraint? So Indian Yeri has, over the past few months, really held back on marketing and following up with households because they're constrained on the pellet supply side. So it's like they want to run, but they can't because they have this sort of technical problem that they can't overcome. We have a lot of stove stacking that we're observing in the household. And so Indian Yeri is hypothesizing that this will really diminish over time. And we have a question about that, and we'll continue to research that. And then are there different marketing or stove pellet packages that would be more or allow people to overcome the constraints that they're facing? Um, I can tell you that Indian Yeri is they're very accommodating and, you know, interested in our findings and working with us and trying to figure out what is the way forward. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Okay, so we have just a few for, for questions. Um, if, if, I think if those of you who are on the you can just type your question into the chat or those of you in the room. Um, um, I, Michael Dawson from the monitoring group. Um, I had a question about the Phillips stove and the transition. When you're asking people about their adoption and how they like the stove, did any of them talk about their experiences with the Phillips stoves? Because I know there were some technical problems with the stoves, and that may have altered people's perceptions of taking on a new stove in that area as well. Yes. So this has definitely been used. The study rolled out uh, with a stove, and then the Mimimoto stoves arrived, and the majority of households had their Phillips stove replaced by a Mimimoto stove. But there was that initial experience that was, for a lot of people, not very good. And so, yes, this is a, a concern that, that the sort of word has spread that the, the stove, the engineering stove, is problematic. Um, the hope is that there are enough of the Mimimoto's out there now and that they are better and so that that will, will help overcome the initial issues associated with the Phillips. But I can tell you there were some households that refused uh, switching. They were happy with the Phillips and they didn't want to make any sort of a change. So some households don't have the Phillips still and we're, we've been carefully tracking that in our data collection. Jill, and then this side of the Oh, wait. Um, Jill there from McGill University. I was just curious if it had a vent, the stove, um, a chimney. No. To it. No. No, not at all. Um, in that part of Africa, it's quite unusual to have any sort of venting on any type of stove uh, beyond a sort of hole in the wall beside your cooking area. So, no, there's no, no venting. Um, hi, thanks. I'm part of the um, Why do you think people are uh, using charcoal more? Why is charcoal more popular, even though people really seem to like it? So you mentioned at some point in the presentation that the photo is sort of the second choice, or when people have a lot of stoves, they use the charcoal one first, and they use the Mimimoto second. What are you finding out? About the end, about any people who are saying smoke or black and hot or that sort of thing uh, are using material that either using material that they're not that's not supposed to go into the stove or using pellets that are uh, wet. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why why is charcoal so persistent? I think part of it has to do with the types of foods that are cooked. So there are lots of beans cooked there, and there 
you know, from dry beans. They're not so parts. So it's a very long cooking process. Lots of uh, hard tubers like cassava and sweet potatoes and things like that. So there, you know, there's something just uh, people ha people know how to cook with charcoal. They have a very high familiarity with it. They like the flavor that <coughs> food cooked over charcoal produces. So, you know, I, I think with, when we dig into the data, my, I guess that people are using the stove more for, for heating. Or, uh, if they've learned how to cook rice with it, because it is fairly, when you use it properly, it's actually very good for cooking rice. So, you know, I think there's a very, it's a very steep learning curve, and it's something that's really different. Um, one of the ideas that Eric Reynolds has, who's the CEO of the firm, is that he wants to put, uh, or the idea is to put sort of dollar signs on the dial because people have a tendency to really crank it up as high as it will go. I think it's human nature to do that, but it's very, uh, it's not the most efficient way to use things. So his idea is to sort of, you know, give people a visual cue that will something about that. So, but I think part of it is really learning. <coughs> And it's, you know, it's an empirical question. We'll find out if over time people learn more and use it more, or another hobby that I'll give up. Yeah. Is there any intervention going on to try to change cooking practices for things that are long cooking, like beans or cassava? So not in a formalized or structured way, but the customer service representative is I meant to regularly check on households, you know, get feedback from customers and ask them, you know, where are the problems and, and offer suggestions to them. And an interesting thing, if you visit the Indian Yuri office, they've always got, you know, six or seven Mimimoto stoves going and people are cooking on them. Like they're really trying to understand how it works and and what you what you can do with it and how to help people. Better. All right, so just in the interest of time, we're just going to, because I don't want us to get behind from the beginning of the day, and maybe read them both out loud, and then if you can just spend 30 seconds wrapping up. <coughs> the one question comes from James Etheridge, who's asking what key messages do the billboards and radio focus on? And then um, Jim Jetter wants to know, um, when you mentioned that the pellets were lower cost than charcoal, was that without the subsidy? Um, okay. So the key messages, sorry, I just want to get them here. Uh, the billboard messages include cook fast, stay, uh, stay clean, life made easy, and always the cheapest fuel. So there's nothing related to health it's all, or environment. It's all, you know, sort of appealing to this <laughs> keep your kitchen clean and tidy and, and be efficient. Um, the, the pellet is the pellet prices are subsidized right now, although the price of charcoal continues to go up and will continue to do that in that part of Africa. And as a result of that, Indian Yeri has also increased the pellet prices. And so that's causing them, it's causing some problems in terms of adoption of the program because people see, people are frustrated by the, the increasing prices. So if you signed up for a package, things are becoming more expensive. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to go on, but maybe we can keep the other questions for the discussion so that everybody has time to present. So our next presentation is going to be made um, to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities of a woman's entrepreneur, entrepreneur um, with some of the work that's been done um, by Hinta Gas in, um, for LPG use in Guatemala. And so that's going to be uh, Dr. Lisa Thompson and Anaita Villavaitiga. We will present the challenges and opportunities of a woman entrepreneur model that I'll be using in Guatemala besides Lisa uh, and I, uh, John Weinstein and uh, Ayari Kesterman contribute significantly on the data collection and analysis. Uh, this is in Guatemala, which is the political in two departments. Guatemala is a single and uh, whole country where 40% is Mayan and the Spanish is your language, and 52% of Guatemalans live in urban areas. Guatemala is the most populous country in Central America, and it has a fertility rate in Latin America. 
um, it also has the highest population growth rate in Latin America and with 25 births per 1,000 people. And over 2 to 1 million households in Guatemala use wood for cooking. In homes used in solid fuels, 24-hour kitchen level concentrations of PM2.5 range from 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter in open fire homes to 150 micrograms per cubic meter in well-maintained chimney self homes. Um, households in Guatemala are adopting LPG stoves with around 50% of urban households using them. Nevertheless, as you can see in the map, the percentage of gas use varies from 90% in Guatemala um, City to 10% in Alta Verapaz, which is one of the poorest um, departments among the two. Uh, you see the star is Zacatepeques. That's what, where our study was conducted, specifically in a municipality called Alotenango. Um, what about household air pollution from use of solid fuels for cooking is the fifth leading risk factor in the burden of the heat, accounting for an estimated 4,000 premature deaths annually, and seven. 0.3% uh, of valleys. And despite effort of local manufacturers to develop clean burning solid fuel stuffs, um, you have considerably reduced household air pollution to levels that are needed to protect health. Our proposal was to, to evaluate the program plan to distribute stoves in Alotenango, a periurban municipality of Zacatepeque. The pilot study was funded by Grand Challenge Canada through the Phase 1 Starts in Global Health uh, Alliance Mechanism. The Gente Gas program is described as uh, to be a high-impact social enterprise dedicated to improving the quality of life of families in Guatemala. And it also is the first social enterprise to offer market-based affordable gas, gas stoves to income families. A community engagement program that teaches entrepreneurship, empowerment, and leadership. This were the three aims of self evaluation study. The first, first was about the study of the adoption of self purchase through the Hentegas program. The second was to evaluate the drivers and determinants of adoption of LP. Gallup and single per run community of Palotenango. And the third was the comparison of household air pollution and sub use between households to purchase Pentagas stubs and other households to use gas stubs purchased through other local businesses. This is an overview of the research method. There were three main phases to our study evaluation. The first phase was the Knowledge Additives and Practices Survey, which was conducted in 188 randomly selected homes that already use LPG stoves. Uh, it has 109 questions, covered demographics, food preparation, use of gas stoves, household practices around wood stove use, health and well-being. The second phase was a series of focus groups and in-depth interviews conducted with different types of fuel users, with Hentegas purchasers of men. Third, three individual interviews were conducted with community leaders, staff retailers, and hand women entrepreneurs. The topics covered in these interviews allow us to qualitatively examine data that emerged from the TAP survey. The third phase was to measure the household pollution in 36 homes that currently use stoves, identifying identify from the CAP survey, and the next household that purchased the Hentegas stoves in these homes. Uh, we measure PM continuously for one week and filter-based PM for a 24-hour period in that week, once a month, for six months, 
And we also place eye buttons which measure temperature on all cells in open fire. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. All right, this is what we're talking here now. Um, the Hente, we're going to turn now to our results of the study. The Hente Gas Pilot Study endeavored to train women entrepreneurs from the local community of Lotanango to sell gas stoves in their communities. In January 2015, 12 women were recruited, recruited and participated in a week-long uh, training, at the end of which two women were retained. In July, uh, five women participated in women's empowerment training developed by um, However, by June 2016, no women entrepreneurs worked for one worked as an employee. Uh, from our interviews with two women entrepreneurs and 14 Hente Gas Stove customers, we found that the women entrepreneurs did not feel that they had received adequate training on stove financing, stove safety, or health messages that would help stove use. Another important finding was that the women entrepreneurs did not understand how they were compensated for stove sales. This was in part um, due to the um, Hente Gas was a new program and was experimenting with different tools to incentivize women to sell stoves. Um, however, the women did not really understand this process. Um, we conducted 14 in-depth interviews with Hente Gas customers and we asked what kind of patient did you receive about the health aspects of an LPG stove? And uh, they said, um, they say gas is better, gas is cleaner, and they left me a paper, an example of a pamphlet that was provided to all households about the benefits of safe gas, gas use. People identified smoke as a problem, not really health as a source of discomfort, as we've seen in others. Sorry about that. I must have. Okay. Maybe you better do this, Cecilia. <laughs> yeah, you do it. Sorry, it's very sensitive. Um, so I will now turn to the results of our air pollution monitoring study. We use the UCB PATS device, which measures PM continuously. We meet in 24 hour PM 2.5 kitchen concentration with 83 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, that's the median. Um, and then with um, the gas. In the, in the households, this is all the households, both Hente Gas and the other um, long-term stove users. The median PM 2.5 was about 45.4. We also looked at how many of the households um, were below the WHO IT3 recommended guidelines for PM 2.5 and found that at baseline, 16% of the households were below that guideline. Yeah, so 36% were. First, we wanted to figure out why this was. Um, we looked at stove stacking using the SUMS monitors. Um, and here we're describing the fraction of stove use in the 25 Hente Gas homes. Um, this allowed us to uh, hit the stove prior to at baseline and then up to six months. Now, just to um, remind you, the SUMS were placed in the homes continuously over six months. Um, and you can see, it, for example, in um, the A graph that the half of the stoves um, who had an open fire open fire at baseline um, were using their gas stove half the time. However, the overall increase from about nine hours to 15 hours. Um, and this demonstrates that people didn't look, cook less actually with their, their wood stove. They just added the gas stove on top. Similar to the findings from Rwanda, people are need to cook large pots of Corn used to make tortillas. Because we recruited households with different lengths of ownership of the gas stove, um, we look at um, gas stove as, as a fraction of stove use in the different households over time. So um, the Hente gas um, fraction of stove use is the first box plot on the far left, and then the other households recruited um, are. Um, on the right, and these are um, over uh, six months of time aggregated measures. So, although the sample size is small, it's many, many measures. 
Um, and we can see there's a steep drop off in one to five years of stove use, um, which may indicate that stove distributors need to focus attention on this, this portion of use where people are either satisfied with the stove or not, and then um, just adopt the gas stove. So now I want to talk about our nine key findings, and the first one is financing and affordability. Um, flexible financing options for uh, credit is necessary for low-income households, although there's some evidence of limited progress. And this is a quote from um, one of the Hensa Gas Stove purchasers, and I will just let you read it yourself. I wanted to point out that, that picture on the right is a true picture of stove stacking. <laughs> uh, the old gas stove was in, but it served as a good surface for the new gas stove. Um, key finding number two, um, stove adoption and sustained use. The LPG stove manufacturers face a functionality challenge. Stove design are not meeting the needs of local consumers and repairs to stoves are not guaranteed especially if these stoves are sold by intermediary companies to manufacture the stove. And I'll let you read the picture. Okay. The third key finding was um, uh, household decision-making. We found that higher income households didn't prior to prioritize the exclusive use of an LPG stove over other consumer items like TVs and radios and um, things like that. And this just uh, shows from our data looking at gas stove use um, at the households below the median and above the median. Um, they used exactly the same amount of gas stove um, use hours per week, um, compliance defined as five hours of gas on their average um, PM 2.5 median concentrations were the same, which points to the fact that there's a lot, just a lot of wood stoves and uh, use in, in this area of Guatemala, despite the fact of owning a gas stove for many years. Our fourth finding um, about household decision making were that men are often the ones making decisions regarding house purchases. We know that. Um, um, their preferences and opinions are often not considered when generating demand for LPG stoves. Um, instead, marketing is focused on the needs of the female cook, and we actually should be focusing on, on the male in the household. Let me read that quote. I do uh, want to mention that we did a focus group with men, which was very interesting and provided a lot of qualitative data. I don't have the time to present today. Fifth key finding is cooking behaviors, and there's a couple of cooking behaviors I'll discuss. The first one, and I underline collective fear about the dangers of gas stove, tanks, and pressure cookers. By collective, I mean pervasive, common, and to some extent mythical. None of the women interviewed had uh, direct experience with an LPG stove explosion or, or may, of course, there's always some mi risk of minor leak. Um, and several did have experiences with pressure cooker malfunctions. I'll let you read the quote. The second cooking behavior um, is similar to Rwanda um, with a pellet stove. The LPG stoves are used for shorter cooking times and for simple foods like frying an egg or, or heating up coffee. The wood stove, um, the plancha, or which is the chimney stove or the open fire, still required um, a staple food preparation like beans and nishtamal, which is the corn used here. One of the quotes I don't have here in the presentation was a woman who said the uh, the, the um, gas stove is desirable, but the um, wood stove is essential. Um, another barrier to disadopting wood that we found, um, which, which was a little surprising, was that fuel collection is seen as a time to spend with friends and family, not necessarily seen as an onerous or dangerous activity. Um, since we often think about fuel collection as a time of, of drudgery, um, we have women in our fuel in our mixed fuel um, user focus group state um, something like this, and I'll let you read it. Uh, 
And our um, second, second to final barrier to disadopting uh, wood stove was something that may be unique to this part of, of uh, Guatemala where there's large coffee plantations. And even homes that have LPG stove will, will stop using their LPG stove when wood becomes free. They collect these from the coffee plantation. Read the quote. And our last key finding um, is that fuel is collected in surplus. Fuel that is surplus is collected and sold, generating income for women. And this picture says a thousand words. Women, um, even if they're using gas and um, wood, this is a major source of income for them. My uh, conclusion slide has a lot of words on it, but I'll try to summarize it. Our conclusions are as following: We evaluated the Hinta Gas pilot study during our during their startup phase which is a period that required flexibility and adaptability as they were experimenting with their model. So during that constrained period, training and retaining women entrepreneurs was not the focus of the, of the Pentagas program. Second, we gas stove use among homes who owned their stoves for one to five years compared to new stove owners or to those that owned their stove for 10 years. So this, this period may be the important period. Visits dropped off to the consumers um, um, because assume that they're using the stove correctly and then something happens in that one to five year period and nobody formal employment couldn't get letters from their employers and therefore had to rely on the program like Pentagas to um, receive credit. But this assumes a lot of risk for new companies when payments are defaulted upon. The first point is that stoves need to be seen as operational, something that people want as much as a, a TV or a stereo. But this remains a challenge, um, partly because we saw a lot of stoves covered up with cloths and protected so that they wouldn't spoil. Um, the fifth problem is to avoid the functionality problems, stove distributors and even tank distributors could educate families about safe, safe stove use. The final point is that men are important and they, sh they should come to no surprise to us. They are the household decision makers and it should be good if we want to see progress in the field of clean cook stoves. And the final um, picture is um, it's tricky, but is a picture of the volcano near our site, um, which was an interesting thing to um, deal with in terms of ambient concentration. So the particular matter concentrations I presented today, they were the sort of background levels of high volume activity. And again, I wanted to end by thanking Dr. John Weinstein and Dr. Maya Hengsterman for all of their work with the data analysis interpretation of findings. Thank you. So we just have now two minutes for questions, comments. Okay. <clears throat> also from Pan American Health Organization. Well, I I wonder if you if notice some people have like a full option of LPG compared with people who that have a very bad option because I think that a very uh, good lesson that we have to learn is from people that really adopt and how they do it, because many people will tell you that you cannot make tortillas with that TV, you cannot make me tamal or many things, but in fact, you can do it, and do it. Oh, indeed, then yeah. it would be very interesting to really learn from that and try to see if, if there is something in the program that we can, like, strip the, the way others do, things that to, to really adopt it. Yeah, that's, yeah, thank you, um, Karen. I think that, um, one, you know, there was so much data from, that we found, especially from the CAP survey, which is on 188, um, LPG users. And so just focusing on that segment of the population, um, among those, uh, 45% only used LPG and didn't use anything else. Um, so looking at, um, the, well, they didn't use an open fire at all for cooking. 
um, and in that area, open fire is, is the complement to the gas stove. Um, so looking specifically at the um, LPG adopters would be important. So this is preliminary data I presented today, and we're still working on dividing up the stove use monitoring by these specific types of users. One thing that is really important is to use the locally receptive and the one that I don't know if we have a picture here. It has the, the square roll. That is the potential of the And also, the towards the top from the way that people use the pressure cooker. Another question I have about the relation, because I understand in Guatemala there is a lot of problems with the cylinders and that. I would like to know about the regulations of the cylinders, the size and the weight and the safety, because I think that there is a lot of issues in Guatemala with respect of that. Yeah, and that was one of the strengths of the Hente Gas Program, is uh, provided their own cylinders and they were in top condition. Um, and so, so I think um, that using examples of safe cylinders um, you know, to buy their cylinders from Hente Gas because the other cylinders were, you know, not um, as good. good. Yeah. So. Is there a role for pellets in a gasifier kind of stove that would fit with the uh, trimming of wood from the finca? We did try that in the respire area a long time ago with the stove from El Salvador, um, but it didn't work. Um, and it was partly because chopping up the pellets, uh, you have to have a system for producing pellets, and we that system I don't know of in Guatemala. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. So I think now um, we're going to take just a, maybe a slightly shorter break there because we actually have another presentation that's been wiggled into the agenda here. So maybe we'll take a break and, and we adjourn at um, 10 o'clock. That's okay, people. And if you need to use the restroom here, it's just if you go down this way, it's the first entry on the left hand side. Thank you. Oh, and
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get back started again, everyone. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. <coughs> Okay, so the next the next presentation is going to be Hi, can everybody please have their seats? It's a little bit loud. Okay, we're gonna get started again. Okay, um, so the next presentation is going to be on the evaluation of the rural LPG program in Ghana. And so, very looking forward to hearing from um, Dr. Kiaste from Chintampa Health Research Center. Maybe, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm presented on behalf of quite a number of scientists from Ghana and also from Columbia University. Next slide, please. So, next slide. I'll be talking about a bit about the background of the rural LPG program in Ghana, and then also um, I'll tell you the objectives of it and then the, the results part and what it means for policy making in, in Ghana and probably other parts of Africa where um, rural LPG programs are being implemented. And then also I'll discuss some um, conclusions that we make out of the data and recommendations we've made to the Ministry of Technology. That is responsible for implementing the rural LPG program. Next slide. Okay. So um, I showed this graph. Let you know the high proportion of that are living in Ghana and are likely to be using biomass fuel. We have a total of about 27 million people living in Ghana, and about 80% of them live in households that are using um, biomass fuel. So that works out to be about 16 million or, or even more, more than that, quite high. And this is a country that has a gross domestic growth of about 4.2%, with quite a high yield, although it's coming down now. Next slide. So um, I'll briefly talk about the inception of the Ghana Rural LPG program. This is a program that was started in 1999 by the then Ministry of Energy. And the whole idea was to distribute um, cylinders and gas stoves to for domestic cooking in areas. However, because of the nature of urban house, 
we had about 20% advance on this was not very successful, it didn't go very far. The rationale for embarking on that program was mainly to arrest the deforestation that was ongoing in Ghana. And also, recently, the rationale for embarking on the rural LPG program is mainly in the health, potential health benefits of LPG use. And we estimate that about 30,400 people would die annually from late diseases based on the global burden of diseases. So in the quest to arrest all these things, the, the government of Ghana um, <laughs> set up the rural LPG program. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, we currently have a target of about 50, to reach 50% of the population of Ghana uh, by 2020 and get them to use LPG space. And this is very ambitious. Uh, uh, 2014, just about 6% of people living in rural areas use LPG, and about 13% uh, uh, about in urban areas use LPG. So to, to get to 50% is really a quantum leap. Uh, the, the program has distributed about, about 75 LPG stores, and they were expecting to distribute about 200,000 by September uh, this year. Next slide. So we were called upon to evaluate the, the program and with funding from GAC and um, other partners in USAID. We decided to evaluate the program and we also used the knowledge and skills that we had acquired from the that is being conducted in Ghana called the GAP study, the Ghana Randomized Air Pollution and Health Study. Um, that study is to look at the impact of hospitals and Earthquakes and also on pneumonia. So I'll quickly go through the objectives of the rural LPG evaluation. As I said, we wanted to evaluate the program, especially to assess the operations of the program, the use of LPG stoves and traditional three stones and as the stoves are being distributed in, 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 in the country. We also wanted to assess the predictors of LPG use and look at the barriers and facilitators of uh, sustained and exclusive use of LPG. And then also we wanted to see how much impact use of LPG in a program like this would have on uh, air pollution. Next slide. And then next. So we Look at five communities, five rural communities in Ghana, and um, in each of the, in the five communities, we selected 200 households that had received the LPG through the program. And in assessing the <coughs> operations of the rural LPG, this is what we found: the Ministry of Health would typically select districts based on a criteria that has been set up by the Energy Commission, and the Energy Commission is a commission that on a continuous basis, LPG use. Next slide. And then um, after that, they identified a marketing company that is located in a district. So in doing so, the aim is to be able to provide access to LPG supply. Next slide. And then they contact the district, they make all the arrangements, and then they do a launch aimed at sensitizing the community about the use of LPG and then they, they start distributing it. Next slide. The next, next please. So, um, the, the program distributes about 50 to 100 beneficiaries on the grounds of the exhibition. And, and it's all the aim of promoting the use and getting people to understand that LPG is good. Then um, the schedule for distribution of the LPG by zone. And zo zones are just small divisions of a district. Next slide. So this is what we found by interviewing 
various stakeholders about the rural LPG program in terms of how by it. Um, generally, people who did not receive the LPG felt that the, the, the selection for the LPG for beneficiaries were biased, and they were biased based on political lines. So that if you were part of a, the ruling government, you are likely to get the LPG. Finished, they gave about, about two thousand strokes to a population of our 140,000. So definitely, there should be some way of selecting and distributing, and this is how they could achieve it. There is also an initial payment of about four dollars, which the beneficiaries think that is expensive uh, to, to come by. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of uh, the launch in the, in the district where we work. Uh, the gentleman you see distributing the soap on your left side is the Minister of Petroleum himself, who went down to, to, to help promote the use of the LPG. And then um, the one on the right shows some beneficiaries. And specifically, they, they also tend to distribute to people um, who are disabled, who, who, who are at risk of a socioeconomic barrier of some sort. Next slide. Uh, so this, the next few slides will talk about LPG use within the program. And a common type of stove that people use in the area was mainly the three stone, and they were supposed to switch over to the LPG um, uh, throughout the period. And this is what one of the beneficiaries said. Is that firewood is common in this community, and you get some anytime you go to the farm. That is why we have become used to the now this stone. So accessibility to firewood um, is a barrier to LPG use. And then also there's the financial constraint. Um, they just cannot afford refilling. This is what someone said. I use the three stone fires because I'm unemployed. If I use coal pot, I cannot buy charcoal. But firewood is easily available in the bush. And charcoal is made out of wood. And uh, it's thought to be a second step after the uh, use of the three stone, which just uses the uh, wood. The other thing is about cooking for large family sizes. And um, they are not able to use the LPG for cooking for large family sizes because it burns faster and they, they have to buy a new one. They are also not able to use it for their preferred choice of, of meal. Um, there's something we call banku, which is made up of corn meal. Next slide. So we asked the question, which stove did you use to cook your main meal yesterday? And right from the beginning of the of them use the LPG that they have received. Next slide. We also asked how many people had refilled the, the stoves. Uh, about 58% of them never refilled the stoves that they, they were provided with. So it's not surprising to see that they were still using their uh, firewood. Just a few people, uh, about 20% have, have refilled one. Um, Less than 5% have refueled about three times. And given the cooking practices, we would have expected that at least they would have refueled about nine times, uh, given what we know in, in the use of um, LPG stove. We expected that at least they, they refueled once per whole of about five people. So we looked at predictors of LPG uh, stove use. And um, mainly, if we compare those who were in the working class, between 31 and 42 years, they were more likely to use the stove compared to those in the younger age group. And uh, we, we think that is because they are a bit more enlightened about the use of LPG, and they also think that it's a, uh, a status symbol, and they, they are likely to use it. We also compared to those who have compared LPG use among those who have been to school and those who have never been to school, those uh, in the middle and technical uh, um, 
bracket of education were likely to use the ethics. But then some traditions were not, traditional groupings were not using the stone. And uh, we think that it's also related to what they do. These, these groups of people are likely to be farmers and uh, not within the high, the high level income group. Now we did not find any association with other predictors of socioeconomic status and household size with the LPG usage. Next slide. Next slide. We looked at um, some of the barriers to use, and I already mentioned about financial constraints. Um, and this was discussed in, in the light of the cost of transportation. So although they could afford the initial LPG gas, they couldn't afford the cost of transportation to use gas. And then also the, the cost of um, refilling was a barrier to some people, and this is what the fishery said. I think that money for refilling the gas will be a hazard. <coughs> Mostly the income we get here is seasonal. When crop season, it might be easy to refill. But when the farm produce gets finished, the filling will stop. So in our thinking, if we should do any intervention, we should consider seasonality of um, income. That's one. Um, the other constraint was fear of possible adverse events, uh, particularly among children. And this was mainly driven by the fact that they had heard about explosions of LPG in, in the country and were also scared about it. However, the study, they didn't find any um, adverse events from any safety issues by wood burning or any other thing. And then uh, distance and unavailability of LPG was also an issue. And uh, um, next slide, please. Yeah, this, this is just a graph showing where the LPG distributing point is. That's the one, the, tri the triangle in yellow. The shortest distance for three kilometers. And this is among the five communities where, where we work. And therefore, if one is to refill a gas, the person would have to travel this distance to do that. Next slide. They, there was also the issue of inability to operate the LPG store. And um, this is a population where people have never used an LPG store. They have never seen one. And this is a, what a, a, a gentleman said when we interviewed them. He said, there are people who know anything at all. Maybe the person is an old lady and will not know how to turn it on and off. But once you have it, you will collect it and put it somewhere. And we actually saw that. They just kept it under the bed and it was just there. And the type of social area was mentioned earlier on, and of course, the, the, the household size. Um, and this was, this was an interesting quote from another man. He says, um, We are many in the household, so we use big cooking pots. It is not as if we cannot use it. If it can cook, but the large family size is a problem. So, these are people who are beneficiary, who, who benefit from using LPG, and they are not the direct users. I mean, the men, mostly the women who who, who cook uh, in the household. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, our, the previous one. However, there were facilitators about the LPG use. People accepted it, and they accepted it because. Um, it provided less cooking time and very um, low emissions of smoke. And uh, this is what a gentleman also said. He said, when you return from the farm hungry and sweating, and you want your wife to prepare something for the food for you, you just scratch a mattress, light the stove, and in no time the food is cooked. But in the case of a three stone fire, you have to fan it some time with the smoke entering your eyes. You may even feel dizzy and collapse. So the gas is very hot. Uh, the other thing is about question of um, um, firewood. We think that the children will perform better if they don't go to collect firewood in the school. Next slide. 
the other facilitators were the fact that women could multitask when they are cooking. So they could be cooking on the LPG and looking after children as well. And then it also promoted millions. Um, so this is what uh, somebody said. He said, before the LPG cook course came, we had the perception that cooking is for women. Because going to, the, going to set fire to cook as a man means you don't have a wife. But now this perception has reduced because of the LP. So the gender issues um, is also very important. As was said earlier on, we need to engage the men. And the distribution of the stove also provided some business opportunities for uh, people in the community. We measured um, carbon monoxide exposure uh, using the last car equipment. This is just a picture of what, what equipment you use. Next slide. What we realized was that there was no difference between the exposures before the stoves were distributed and at three months, six at nine months. And our hypothesis is that if you give only 2,000 household uh, LPG stoves and leave about 20,000, you're not going to make a significant impact on carbon monoxide exposure in the household because the households are very clustered together. Next slide. So we've made several recommendations to the, the Ministry of Petroleum. The fact that they need to have a strong monitoring evaluation uh, program, the fact that they need to involve Ministry of Health um, and also start a cylinder recirculation program and then to ensure that LPG is used for this next slide. So in conclusion, I would say that the UR LPG is a, a great program which is appreciated by the community. Um, the challenges will just have to be addressed. And then we'll, we need to ensure that there's a continuous uh, monitoring and evaluation beyond this, these five communities in which we work. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. Comments? Tammy? Ben Pound? So you talked about Am I doing this right? You talked about the effect of other houses on the houses that received the LPG. What fraction of the housing village were involved in the LPG program? So there are 2,000 households involved in the LPG program in the district where we work. Out of about 20,000 houses. Okay. This is just about okay. Um, I wanted to ask about this qualitative assertion that school children are going attending school more or doing better in school. Do you have any additional data that back up that thought, or do you think it's do you think that's true? Well, uh, we, we don't have any quantitative data to back that. But we did assess that in this project. They usually would go and gather fire would early in the morning or late in the evening. And if it were, these are my children, I wouldn't want them to do that because those are the times they have to be preparing for school. They have to be coming back, learning, doing their homework and all that. <coughs> so I uh, quantified it, but I, I, I have a gut feeling that this could be real. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was just wondering if if Ghana's been running this this program for such a long time, there, and it, it obviously hasn't penetrated a lot of places, but there must be a few places where they have a long experience. And I'm wondering if you could say something about that, if they've learned something about the LPG distribution system and the challenges that that LPG distribution system has in places where it's been running a long time. Uh, thank you. So the program that started in 1989 was mainly in urban areas, and it got stopped. So it wasn't very successful. So there are no communities that have been exposed to LPG all along within a program. Um, but our plan is to go back to these same communities that we went in maybe 18 months after, and then um, 24 months after, and see what challenges or what changes are. 
Um, hi. Uh, you had mentioned this issue about people feeling fearful that there's something going to, you know, if the gas tank is going to explode. And Lisa, you mentioned this kind of mythical concern. Do you think that people are really worried about that, or they just kind of say that as an excuse to not take it on? Uh, and also, are there any awareness campaigns to help address that? Because obviously, as you mentioned, there were no adverse events as, uh, over the course of your, your study. Well, yeah. And then, what's driving this fear? Well, what's driving this fear is after explosions within the city, which gets spread all over the country. So there are real cases of LPG explosions that kill many people within the city. So that, that's the fear. But once people get used to using the LPG, they get experience of using it, then they, that sort of uh, anxiety drives up. We, in our draft study, distribute about uh, 300 LPG stoves over a year, over, more than a year, the one of such incidents. And with time, they are confident in using the LPG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I didn't show my acknowledgement slide, but mm -hmm. we have really all folded and Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, KP. And now um, it's actually a, a slight departure from the original program, but really pleased that we actually have um, not Jan Paul Johnson, who's here with us um, today, to to give a very brief overview of the. Uh, of the project that's ongoing in Cameroon with looking at uh, evaluation of LPG adoption there, and, and we'll c we'll continue with the with the scheduled program after this after this talk. Thanks, Amy. Let me just point out very quickly. Uh, a small caveat about my presentation is that I am not in any way actually affiliated with this project. <laughs> Other than I was in Cameroon a couple days ago with Dan and Nigel, and so I got the Im immersion process. So uh, they asked me if I would present some slides because I know they were originally scheduled. Um, and thank you guys for re-slotting them in here. And I'm going to try and go through this a bit quickly and just kind of highlight some of the things that they found um, because I know the agenda didn't account for this. Um, okay, so this is the, the lay study about LPG adoption in Cameroon. And let me see if I can. Okay. Um, so, some of the, the main reason why this study is happening is there's a lot of evidence that LPG is a, a really good option for addressing some of the health problems. And this is highlighted in the WHO. WHO, air quality guidelines, um, and, and we're seeing more and more recent LPG. Um, and so this, this was an opportunity to look at some of the factors that are um, potentially getting in the way of adopting LPG and, and what are some of the benefits of having it as well. Um, so why Cameroon? One thing, one thing that's really nice about Cameroon is you have a lot of government support right there in, in Cameroon. And they have uh, about 12% penetration to right now. It's a regulated market. But they want to increase that to 65. But the government has a solid target to try and increase LPG 65%. Um, and LPG is subsidized as well. So there's a lot of government support. There's also a partnership with a, a global LPG partnership, which is, is helping um, uh, with this project as well. All right. So there are two parts of the study. There's the latest one. One project, late project. And the latest one project is kind of racking up, and we just have some very slim results from that. Uh, the latest two study is something that's, that's ramping up right now. So at latest one, there are a couple different components. One were what were the factors that were um, enabling or inhibiting people from using LPG, and then also looking at the impact of household air pollution, safety, risks on livelihoods. Um, there are quality Quantitative, quantitative research components. The quantitative research components were mainly looking at stove use, stove use patterns, air quality, exposure, things like that. And then the qualitative research, that's what, that's where um, the team's drilling down on those factors that are 
uh, inhibiting or enabling adoption. Uh, two study sites, one in Limbe, and that's actually where I was, which is a, a more English-speaking area, um, and it's a peri-urban area, and they were contrasting that with another site, um, uh, in Bol uh, I haven't been there, so I can't pronounce um, it, Bolmayo. Um, anyways, so this uh, area is more rural and uh, a lower socioeconomic status, and so they won't pair these two communities. There are three different phases, uh, kind of a large-scale survey, 1,500 homes is fairly rapid, quantitative data collection where you're collecting the stove use measurements, the air quality, um, and also doing some, some quantitative surveys. Um, there's the qualitative data collection, so you have some some structure views, allow households to really get into some of these factors that are hopefully enabling or potentially inhibiting uh, adoption. Um, so a few preliminary results. I know this hard to read up there. Um, this just shows you the contrast of the LPG use between the two communities. So on the left is the rural area, um, and on the right is the very urban area. And the big bar, uh, or I guess the small bar in the middle on the left, shows you that LPG use is not used very much in the rural area, but it was a, a, a main field that was used in the very urban area. Um, breaking it down by income, and this was somewhat interesting. Um, so if we look at the rural area, this is broken down by comment. The highlighted one up there in the top left of the graph shows the low income bracket that they looked at. And, and you can see that uh, the primary LPG use is relatively low. So just any or all LPG use in those homes was a relatively small fraction of homes within the small income bracket. But when you go to Limbe, so this is the, the more peri-urban area, you look at the same income bracket, right? So presumably the same number of resources or the same amount of resources, but you see much higher use. Um, now, whether or not that's due to, uh, you know, improved access or maybe differentiation between the income bracket or, or education or, or things like that, I don't think that analysis has been done yet, but at least it seems to indicate that, uh, you know, at the same economic level, you're seeing higher use in the peri-urban area. Um, this is a really interesting finding, and I'm not sure what other groups are seeing, um, but these are reasons that uh, people cited for not using. Uh, LPG in their homes, um, and so some people said they're happy with wood and safety concerns. But the biggest here, at least cited by the people, was the initial cost, so the initial cost of getting the LPG in the tank. Um, guys, or was it 50% and 54% in, in the two different areas? But if you look below, the refill cost was something that almost nobody cited, um, and so looks like there's a very of just the cost. And if you can get past that, the actual cost of LPG in Cameroon at least is slightly lower than charcoal. So this is a, a good opportunity um, for potentially increasing fee use if, if you can get past that. And so a lot of work they're doing is looking at microfinancing and financing mechanisms. Um, I'm going to skip that slide, not too exciting. Um, but this, um, so this is a little bit of very preliminary results from some of the quantitative survey, and, and this looks at reported health-related impacts. Um, and something that's interesting here is the LPG group is on the is in the blue, and the wood is the, is the um, I think the wood and the mix are the lighter blue shades. Um, something that's interesting here, and, and was interesting to hear about some of the fears about, you know, explosions and things like that, you see that the burn rate seems to be lower for the LPG users, right? And, and so this is perhaps an opportunity to leverage uh, that safety concern in the other way. I, and I think something that we often hear is people aren't that interested or aren't that persuaded by health effects. Um, you know, like long-term effects. But burns may be something that's a little bit easier for people to understand, right? So this is maybe uh, a point that people can highlight. Um, showing that LPG can be safe in terms of burns and went into kids. I'm sure that's something that uh, families are worried about. Um, so, Lace 2, I'm just, I'm just going to touch on this very quickly. This is what's going on right now. They're starting to ramp this up. Um, and so based on some of the initial findings that they're getting, they know that they need to look at microfinance. And so um, evaluating the effectiveness of microfinance is going to be a big thing as part of uh, Lace 2 and 
place too, and they're also going to be looking at um, some different approaches for increasing adoption. So one of the things is, is uh, providing uh, pressure cookers um, because those events that take longer to cook, those, those would take uh, more time. And then another approach, and I'm going to highlight this because I think this is kind of cool. I'm going to do these. I know I don't have much time. Um, there's the pressure cooker one. Um, but I do want to highlight which is a kind of a novel approach about identifying some of the uh, problem areas that you get. We give a small group of, of cooks cell phones to take pictures when they're having a problem with the LPG stove or a meal that they can't cook or whatever it might be, some type of problem, and they can take a picture of that and write a caption and send that to the survey team. And the survey team can follow up with them in an iterative process to see what solutions might be there. So um, I'm not sure what will come of this, but it seems like a, a novel approach to try and assess an issue that we see is important. Um, trying to displace that traditional stove as much as possible and having these problem spots where you can't cook specific foods or do specific tasks with with the, uh, that given technology. So anyway, I wanted to highlight that. I think, I think that's all I got. Yeah, so uh, on behalf of the team, I know um, the, uh, they're funded by CDC, NIH, and uh, definitely working with the global uh, LPG partnership. So, um, that's what I got. Apologies that I'm not Dan. I don't have his nice accent. I just, uh, but uh, thank you guys for uh, listening to what they have going on in Cameroon. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and so I think we'll move now to Julia's presentation. Uh, oh, one comment? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, just one comment. I I think about safety is a really important one, and it's a perception issue, as I think is coming up, in that there are documented events that are newsworthy and, and stick in people's minds, but the frequency is so low compared to burns in many places. And so figuring out the communication around that is probably an important key. Most people don't relate to numbers so well, and, you know, in in these kind of communities, but I think that's an important challenge for us all. I, I just, sorry, this is to me. I just do want to play devil's advocate a little bit on that statement, which is that we have been doing some work with WHO and CDC also in terms of much more of their information on burns and injuries and the causes. And a couple hundred thousand burns deaths every year, and 95% um, of those are in developing countries. And so we're trying to get a better sense of what the real cause is are of those different burns in different places. Um, so one of the things that we have seen, I mean, it's true that you may have kind of minimal burns and injuries that are occurring as a result of, 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 of traditional cooking. But in fact, that when you do have the burns happening associated with LPG or in sometimes with kerosene, I mean, they're really catastrophic. They can take out entire families with things. So I think that it's something which it may not happen as often, but it's certainly something. Um, we've got a lot of data from India now, um, but I think it's, it's something. It's something to still, and I think it really does get to this issue of of, of the maintenance um, and making sure um, that the maintenance and things like that can be done properly. So I think it's it's worth noting. But not to discord you, but that's why I think that the um, activity happening in Guatemala and other places looking to also improve the quality of the vendors of banks to have some kind of sort of seal of approval of a higher standard is absolutely essential. One of the one of the things that happens and we've seen this in a lot of global health studies is particularly families with epilepsy. Uh, children, especially, um, have epileptic fits, and if there is a fire burning in the house, it's not uncommon for them to roll into them and have very serious life-threatening burns. That's part of where that is. I was just going to say, I think it's a little like the plane crash effect, right? It's when a 747 goes down and 200 people die, it takes the front page of the newspaper, even though a lot more people die in car crashes. And so the perception, I'm not quite sure how to deal with that change. But it's, it's the fact that the events are dramatic, not that they affect one. 
Um, and, and just to add to that, I mean, part of it, and if you, if you see actually some of the LPG industry association, like the World LPG Association, I mean, when this, these things happen usually when there are some certain issues and challenges related to circulation, distribution, and maintenance of the cylinders. So they know really waiving this, and so the, the, the challenge is to make sure that when you're actually expanding the distribution system, you're doing it in a way that you can actually prevent these things from happening, essentially. The main issue is how to communicate this to the people who use the LPG in a place where they have never used it. Yeah. So yes, the plain the plain example is is a good one. Although I'm going to travel back to Africa. So, <laughs> you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> but the point the, po the point is that it's, it's it's all about the communication and getting them to understand the benefits and what what is associated with. Um, before we started the graph style, we, as the scientists, were all skeptical about it. But then we wrote it on, and we've not had one example of safety concern. And it's because we ensure that any time there were leakages in the LPG uh, tubes and all those things, we got repaired. So the maintenance was quite uh, good. Can I just please request that everybody uh, introduce themselves when they ask a question or respond just to the folks on the phone? Thank you. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that group, they were primarily LPG users, I believe. No. Yeah. Could, could be. I, I, I mean, it's sample business, but also there's the little draft that's going to come. Oh, okay. So, Tammy Bond, University of Illinois. I'll do this right this time. And my my question is the the mixed um, the mixed bar and why it's a, a bit particularly for female burns um, or for 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 women burns and just wondering if when you have both types of stoves, your risk is higher because you're using both of them, you can burn by either one of them, um, or I, I'm not sure why that is. I'm just saying that we saw evidence that LPG was not displacing all the cooking and sometimes displacing none of it. And so then we want to ask if, um, if that's really a solution to burns until we understand more of a, of, about how it penetrates into the household. I think I can clarify. I'm remembering now, and again, I'm sorry for my clunkiness around this presentation, but um, hopefully that's understandable why it's the case. Um, so the LPG group, they were primarily LPG users. Um, the wood group, they were exclusive wood users. The mixed group, they were primarily wood users with an LPG stove. So I think that maybe explains it a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, we we don't know what the exact rates are within those homes of wood and LPG use. For well, we were seeing from the last presentation was that, or one of the presentations was that people who brought LPG in, it became an extra use. And if that's what your mixed bar is, then we, I think we need to be a little bit careful about implying that simply getting it into the home is a way to decrease risk. This, this was a cross-sectional study as well, yeah. Right, great. Well, um, thank you for that discussion. Um, so we're now going to move um, to a presentation um, by Dr. Julia Rosenbaum um, talking about some of the WASH Plus findings um, on adoption and willingness to pay studies in Nepal and Bangladesh. Thank you. And um, it's, 
pleasure to be able to briefly present two studies to you all. There's a number of familiar faces who have actually seen a similar presentation already and know this study well, so this is your time to multitask. Um, and I hope there's a lot of, uh, or a few new, uh, new audience members on the phone as well as here in the group, so thank you. Um, what I'll be doing is presenting a, a new methodology as well as some findings from uh, studies from Bangladesh and then repeated in Nepal to assess consumer preference and willingness to pay. Uh, conducted through the USA Wash Cut. Next one, please. So, why consumer preference studies? Really, because when you look at the world from a different perspective, it's completely different. So, is this six or nine? Um, and we would really argue that improved efficient stoves are really often developed from the household, from the perspective of the household energy specialist focusing on building stoves that use less fuel and put out fewer pollutants. And we're really just starting to pay more attention, if you will, to the other side of the coin, but how does it look from the, the consumer point of view? And that we're not going to see that adoption and sustained uptake until we, we get there. So um, as we all know in the room, and this is, you know, we're sticking to the choir, but we know that concrete is so important because cooking is really personal. Um, if cooks don't like or can't buy the stoves, well, then they won't use them and we won't see the benefits in the most simple. And I think even just this morning, and we all know that really that there's no one size fits all when it comes to, to cook stoves, even within a single country or a single district or a single household. And that's really critical that there's no one size fits all. We know that lab performance does not equal field performance in any way, and we really have to start looking at that gap between efficacy and effectiveness and what happens when it actually gets in the hand of the users who, who do their own thing. Um, and often the best stoves can really be unappealing to the cooks. You can go to the next one. So um, I think, you know, let's say why consumer press is that often the people who need these stoves most are, are the poorest in our communities, and they have higher priorities for their for their money. There's a lot of people demand, and particularly when you have free fuel out there as an alternative, um, we really need to start looking at the preference. And so, um, with all this in mind, what we did was try and design a method that would elicit what are those attributes to a cook stove, both at what do people look for, and then what are the perceived benefits. So, like our discussion about burns not burn, safety of LPG, uh, of course the reality matters very much, but the perception is equally as important um, to get at. And so what are those perceived benefits and costs for using the stove? The objectives also that we had were to compare our reactions to five different stove types. And so we weren't comparing particular brands of stoves, but rather types of stoves. To assess willingness to pay, to test the uh, in household fuel use, and probably most important, and what you see in bold, was that we were really looking to make recommendations to USAID projects, the Clean Cooking, um, Catalyzing Clean Energy, Ladesh, GCEG, and in Nepal, um, AETC, the Alternative Energy Promotion Center, to make some recommendations that would really help to open the market in those countries. So using that same paradigm of Global Alliance, but to open the market to a better use of stoves. Now, we were using at this point just um, wood stoves, and we can talk about that decision. Things have evolved a bit since then, and even, even Nepal and, and Bangladesh, but um, we're using wood stoves. So, under Wash Plus, we introduced um, really to this community what's a very classical marketing approach, which is the marketing mix that considers four Ps, the product, the price, the place, and promotion. And this, as I should say, this is really old school marketing, but um, we're suggesting that we have a lot more so if we focus really on manipulating this four P mix, and that our community, for the most part, has worked on product development with more and less consumer perspective, and then promoting the thing. And just, again, the, the data this morning that we've been hearing, things like, you know, how do you promote something but from that audience point of view? So your suggestion of focusing perhaps on burn, you know, burn, fewer burns, reducing burns rather 
than help, or the fact uh, from Ghana that you can get sort of a quicker meal from the field. Um, so focusing on those benefits that people value, not just it's good for you kinds of benefits, but really manipulating. When we look at things like pricing, manipulating, again, not only the, the, the um, final price, but how financing to help to make things accessible to people. And then the place, not only to make it convenient where these stoves are being offered or the, the LPG refills, but to have it a credible place that, that uh, reinforces some of the promotion benefits we're looking at. So I think in part because many of you have seen what I'm going to present, um, I want to focus really on this mix and, and how um, using it more and more to really try and come up with your marketing mix for countries could be quite helpful for increased adoption and sustained use. So um, in Bangladesh and in Nepal, this was our starting point. This was the PD, the product competition, if you will, the traditional mud soap with some first conducted the study in Bangladesh and then learned from, uh, learned from the experience and modified the methods and, and repeated it in Bangladesh. I'm sorry, in Nepal. In Nepal. So, so to re we were testing types of stoves, not particular brands, and we were not focusing on uh, imported stoves per se, but rather this new class of improved stoves. And we selected five stoves in each country that had potential for either manufacture or assembly in country. So we were taking a local perspective to this. Um, we initially selected a mix of built-in place, portable, single pot, and double pot, chimney and not, and, and you, can see, uh, you can see above in Bangladesh we did the EnviroFit and the EcoZoom, the middle three we used in both, both countries. Very interesting is that uh, some stoves were modified in the SUSI, so I'll talk about that, but we gave the feedback to the manufacturers. We offered them a $5,000 incentive, and three of the five took us up on it, and they made some adjustments in the stoves themselves between the studies. I'm flying to the sum of this also for time just to focus, if you will, uh, on some of the key points. So I think many of you know um, the, the method that we have been developing, but um, consumer preference styles really is a mix of quantitative and qualitative methods in concert. It really draws on a method that we use first in nutrition uh, and in HIV, in dengue, but it really engages respondents as consultants and with a lot of interaction between the interviewers and the respondents. Um, says it requires interviewers and, uh, and field staff that are very, have to be flexible and still stick to a protocol. So essentially, as you can see here, the tips trials approved practice includes semi-structured questions, qualitative and quantitative, with a time element. So that we began with a baseline and demographic survey and insulation. Then go back, went back three to six days later. We really looped back sort of as quickly as we could, if you can think about a, a field schedule, and made sure that, the, that people understood the stoves. We got their initial assessment, but also we wanted to prom up. So they had a problem. We didn't wait till the end of the study. We actually corrected it midstream, which is a different kind of research methodology, because we wanted those stoves to be working correctly and people knowing you. Um, they often did need a little bit of chiropractic, if you will, after that, that first trial in the home. And then, depending on the interval, um, we conducted an end-line survey uh, that ranged, if you will, from three weeks in Bangladesh to four months in Nepal. There was a, a pesky problem of a little war going on, and we literally couldn't get, no one could get out to the field with any kind of safety. And so we had a a long period over time. We had four months, and that added a sort of some new elements. Um, next slide, if you would. We also did some market demonstrations. It was a sort of a fake marketplace where we set the stoves into a market. We did them at bus junctions where people were waiting around for a long time, and we just wanted for new study participants to get some reaction. What did people think of these things? And we had sort of secret shoppers or silent observers watching and taking notes on this whole thing. Um, next slide. I'm just going to run through these next ones really quickly. Um, uh, willingness to pay methodologies, and we used to really test out. We feel like we need to make some new headway in assessing. 
So many of you know that the classic willingness to pay is called an auction, and we shifted that a little bit to be more, more we thought, the developing country context. No one in their right mind would say how much they're willing to pay. That doesn't happen in the third world. If you went to a market and said what you really want to give, you'd be left out of the market, but you'd lose a lot of money. So instead, we did a bargaining element instead um, to this willingness to pay auction that's often used, and we can run through. And then you could either pay in a lump sum or installment payments. And we tried to see which uh, had appeal to which consumers. And we did a buyback for those of you who know, so a la the price is right. We said, here, thanks for participating. That is a stove. Isn't this beautiful? Or if you like, we'll give you, and we had a depreciated value of the stove, but it was a chunk of cash for a poor household, ranging on the, the value of the stove, ranging about 10 I think the highest was six dollars uh, equivalent. So we did these two methodologies that we'll you'll see the, the, the findings. Next one. We also did classic CCPs and, and KPTs, controlled cooking tests and, and kitchen testing. So to really look at the performance in the local context and fuel consumption. Next one. And we had some stove use uh, monitoring to determine how frequently the stove was used, to what extent it, the use displaced uh, traditional stoves, how much stacking was uh, was happening in the setting. Yep. So here in front of you, um, this matrix, um, you have the the basic uh, uh, of the two studies. You can see. The quantum called methods tested over time, small samples that were both purposively and random um, elements to the selection. And I'm just going to give you a smattering of the findings and then we'll, we'll talk about them. So um, probably most significantly for the CCTs, we see significant fuel savings. They vary by the different stoves, but 29 to 47% fuel savings. I'm not harping too much on the, the finance because I'm hoping we can get to some of the more marketing and behavioral in a minute. Sorry, um, I'm going to say we had also reduced cooking times. We're going to fly here. Next one. Keep going. So, so um, no. So, so I think one very important. If we look here, we asked which stove you preferred. Um, the, the improved stoves were preferred in Nepal. It went down slightly over four months, but not much. Next one. It varied by the different stoves, but the same pattern. Next slide. Very important, though, when you looked at Bangladesh, you saw that for Matt, about 60% 60, 60 uh, preferred the stove at first, went down after just three weeks. And a lot of that had with the full preparation. People just had no patience, um, or beyond patience, they had no interest in shopping. Those little, it changed how they cooked. They could no longer multitask with the wood, chop, and dice. Um, there was a free legal available and work for, so they, they resented having to give up. Next, two, four, please. Next one. Um, even though they didn't prefer them, they still liked elements of these stoves, and that's important to say. They didn't completely displace their traditional stoves, but they liked the improved stoves. They used different stoves for different purposes. Next one, I'm really flying now. Uh, keep going. Oh, no, stay on that one. Um, so who would buy? We also wanted to see really different results in Bangladesh. What kind of person would use these stoves? In, that, in Nepal, ordinary person. In Bangladesh, very few people thought they were for ordinary people. They thought they were for modern people, for small families, and you can see my family fish list. That is one in Ghana we were saying, you know, the poor man who had no wife to do it. Then you could use one of these improved stoves. Um, let's go on. Um, willingness to pay, I'm harping for just a minute to say, again, in Bangladesh, people were not willing to pay. Out of 105 households, one household wanted to buy a stove. When we did the little buyout back, though, surprisingly, when we removed the barriers, when we said, here's the stove, they wanted to keep it. In, ba in Nepal, quite different, though. People wanted to buy the stove. We had more than half who actually put out um, cash to buy the stove. Paid cash. The other, uh, there were 14 of the, the 37 households that did it on installment plans. Next, next, next. 
You know the next one. I'm going to have to. Next one? That one's for Michael. What? No, no. Stick on the asshole, please. <laughs> so, so, whole of collecting data is to use it. And so often I think we get in all this great data and then we go ahead and do what we want anyway. And so if I leave you with anything, we have to apply these findings to our work. Next one. <laughs> Next slide. So there, you'll remember something. So what we did was take all these data and we tried to apply them to the marketing mix. And in very little time, but the next one, and then I promise I'll end. So in Bangladesh, the majority Majority of holes did not prefer these stoves over traditional stoves. They weren't willing to pay for them, so we had to listen. And we recommended to CCB be a national program that the Global Alliance is working very closely with. They didn't add these stoves to their portfolio. They did use the features that people wanted, and they identified and developed different local models with much lower stove performance, but things that people were interested in. And I think really importantly, manufacturers listened, and it's not quite human-centered design from scratch, but they made changes. They made a stove that could make a bigger pot to make the, the gruels, the rice that people wanted to make at one time. In Nepal, enthusiastic support. People were willing to pay, and so the recommendations were for AEPC to move forward with inclusion of these class of stoves that had those benefits. Um, just to go to the next one, and it's really a slide. So thank you to our funders, our implementation partners. And if anyone is interested, this is now a toolkit that was painstakingly developed. You can download all the tools. You can have templates for analysis where you can really have a, a screen-driven data entry, analysis, graphics programs to print out your findings. Next slide. And it is available on the um, Watch Plus website. And I don't I think it's up yet on the Global Alliance, but we will be making that happen. So thank you all. Thanks for this. Two minutes. Thank you. Um, so I think, unfortunately, we're really out of time. Maybe if, if there's maybe one quest, burning question somebody has, otherwise we'll have time during the discussion as well. Um, and if, if not, then we'll... I'll say go ahead, Walden. No, but it's good, huh? <laughs> um, so the question was whether the SAMS data reported, reflected the self-reported responses on preference. I don't get it. Oh, no, absolutely not. And what's interesting, and we can go in, is we actually did then try to calculate over-reporting, under-reporting. So what's not nice triangulation, as you can see what people say they do. As a behavioralist, you have a real problem with reported behavior, and you never quite know. And when you have the sums, you literally calculate how much is over-reported. They want to be nice to you and tell you they used it. Um, so they did not at all. We had a lot of over-reporting and surprise of use because we're the nice, you know, the nice people, and so we became assholes. You know, we were the nice people that... Uh, we're coming into their houses. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so with that, we're going to be moving to the presentation by Dr. Jill Baumgartner, who um, has been part of a collaboration that's being supported by Welcome Trust. Um, and she's going to be talk to us about the, the work that they've been um, doing to look at environmental and nutritional interventions for improving cardiovascular health in China. Sure. Uh, this is going to be a total shift in what we've been talking about. So. Um, so this is an observational study, but um, at least it might give some ideas in terms of, you know, linking into existing cohorts and what are some ways to do that and understand, you know, we spend a lot of time sort of implementing stoves, um, but there's also a lot to learn from people who have already shifted uh, to different stoves and fuels. Um, oh, I can't see this. Okay. Uh, how do I just communicate this? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of people on this. This is a very interdisciplinary project. Um, engineers, uh, people who work on the uh, exosomic cardiogenic cardiovascular epidemiology, and you'll see one in a few seconds. Uh, just to give you an idea of the study uh, platform for this, so in 1996, uh, there was the Intermap China study, which was a study looking at dietary sodium in intake and blood pressure. Um, and so as part of that study, 
Uh, this is before there was, there was some knowledge that sodium was potentially bad for cardiovascular health. There are lots of places where they did this, but uh, in the China branch, uh, they enrolled men and women in three provinces. Um, and they did measurements of dietary recalls. So this is a 24-hour dietary recall. It's about an hour to hour and a half long survey. Um, lots of anthropometric measurements. Uh, and then also information on, on fuel use, which is relevant for us. And then two 24-hour urine collections. And for people who aren't familiar for that, it's, with that, it's basically you have people carry around pockets or some sort of containers, and they collect their urine in it over a 24-hour period, which is very useful for some of the metabolomics and biomarker kind of stuff that we're interested in now for exposure assessment. Uh, next slide. Um, and there's a diversity of fuel use patterns in these rural sites. So Shanxi is a site in northern China where coal is used for both cooking and heating. Uh, next. Uh, very urban Beijing, uh, which use, use coal for heating. Uh, predominantly is using uh, biomass uh, for cooking, though there's a lot of transitioning, moving to LPG in this area. Uh, next one. And then southern site in Guangxi, um, this is uh, one of the more, it's more remote than our other locations. Um, there's, it's a heavily wooded area. There's not the same name for heating as there is in the north, um, so it's mostly biomass uh, cooking as well as other cleaner burning fuels. And so what we did is we went back and we uh, found all of the intermat participants who were still living in those communities and alive. Um, so we re-enrolled about 65% of the original participants uh, into our study in the north. Guangxi actually data collection is ongoing right now. Um, and then we also enrolled new participants. The reason why we enrolled uh, younger participants in this case, so the original participants are now in their 70s uh, and 80s. And we wanted to enroll younger participants for the biomarker study. So if you're trying to look at, um, uh, you know, metabolomics or changes within the body that might be related to exposure, we need to have some idea of what that looks like in that population several years ago. So we have to enroll people now, and then we can compare at two different time points. And then we do lots of uh, additional measurements, air pollution exposure, cardiovascular markers, cognitive function. Uh, we do blood collection as well as spot urine collection and verbal autopsy for the people who died in the original cohort. Um, so the goal of this study uh, is to measure cardiovascular function and its association with both long-term fuel use and air pollution exposure in three regions, regions of China. Um, and the second goal of this is to try to, to identify novel biomarkers of household air pollution exposure. So what are uh, potential metabolite or meta metabolite profiles uh, in urine or blood that might be related to their exposure so you can identify different uh, levels of exposure. Um, and that then can help inform, if they're associated with clinical responses, help inform what are the, the uh, mechanistic drivers between that exposure and, and uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, so just to give an idea of this, the risk factor exposure, I'm referring to air pollution. We do both surveys to assess fuel and uh, <coughs> measure their uh, personal exposure. Um, we do detailed measurements on both the samples of air pollution as well as the biomarkers that we collect. Um, and then you're looking at the relationship between all of those and clinical symptoms. Um, so things like blood pressure or arterial stiffness. And uh, lastly, uh, again, um, and the goal of this is that you're better able to assess interventions, right? Because you can enroll a larger population. And one of the main uh, problems I think all of this face is trying to assess exposure. It's a huge bottleneck in the number of people you can enroll. Um, so we're doing this in about eight. Now we're doing it about 1,000 to China. But, you know, we need 60 personal exposure monitors. Um, and lots and lots of QHQC that comes with that. So if you can actually just collect a blood sample or a urine sample and that helps inform your exposure, you can do that in a lot more efficient way. Um, so this, we, to assess uh, stoves and energy, we basically had people go through uh, all these pictures of different stoves and we want to know what device they're using right now, what devices have they used, when did they stop, um, so it's really trying to get an idea of comprehensive stove and fuel use over the last 20 years. Uh, next slide. Um, 
And these are really the only results I'm going to show because we're, we're right in the middle of data collection for this study. Um, but this is the use of cleaner fuel in two of our sites, the Perry Urban uh, Beijing and the Shanxi site. This is just when they started using uh, cleaning and heating fuel uh, because at baseline, all of them were using solid fuel. So there's been some transition over the past 20 years uh, where they've started to use cleaner burning fuels. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is just if they've totally suspended solid fuel use, and we're really strict on this. That means that they cannot be use it, using it in any single stove or cooking device in their home at any point in time during the entire year. So we tried to keep that as strict of a definition as possible. And as you have some people 15 years ago that were doing uh, suspension of solid fuel cooking and solid fuel heating at our site, um, but we've seen a lot of change in Um, so we do personal 24-hour uh, personal exposure uh, uh, at two time points in two seasons, um, and I put a success rate for this. I'm really proud of, of how we've been able to get to such high success rates for full 24-hour measurements. If you look at most studies, they tend to be 75 or 80 percent, um, and we're getting 100 uh, percent at most of it, at least two 24-hour measurements. Uh, next slide. We did a handful of cardiovascular measurements. Uh, these are done with physicians uh, so that they can interpret the results for participants, usually with uh, cardiologists at most of the sites. Um, so we look at arterial stiffness, blood pressure, uh, and uh, several measures of um, carotid, uh, carotid into the media thickness, plaque, and stenosis, which are um, basically in your carotid artery. If you have a thickening of that, it's related to your cardiovascular uh, risk. Um, and people want to talk any of these measures. Uh, I'm happy to chat about it. Um, we do a bunch of additional health measurements, uh, so dietary recall. Uh, we get really detailed <coughs> information on medications, so people bring in all the medication that we're doing. We go through every single one with them, uh, which can, can, for some people, is up to 20 different medications. Um, and we also do biospecimen collection. So as I talked about, we do 24-hour urine collection with one pre and post spot urine before and after pollution exposure assessment. Um, we do dry blood spot and whole blood collection as part of that as well. And we've been really excited about the success that we've had with this. So in Shanxi, uh, in the northern site, we had 99% of the participants who had beer samples, 98% that had dried blood spot and whole blood. And in Beijing, it's just slightly lower. So we're getting, you know, close uh, to 86 uh, complete measurements. Uh, next slide. I, I'll end here, but I think one of the things that I, I want to at least mention is that we're doing measurements of ambient air pollution and analysis of, of chemical composition and sources at these sites. And on the left-hand side, those are pictures. Well, one of it is our ambient air pollution monitor, which is attached to, like, a random piece of farm equipment so it doesn't get stolen. Um, but that, that Shanxi and what it looks like in the city closest to the villages at around 10 a.m. in winter. And I think – you know, for, for all of us, we always talk about these source settings, um, but there's really a blurring between household and ambient air pollution, right? We, I think in, in a lot of sense, it made, it made a while back to be like, well, that's household, that household, there's ambient, different sources, we're going to think about them differently, but rural areas are not the same as they were 150 <laughs> years ago. This is a review that uh, my student is working on, and these are the only studies that have been done in household air pollution settings on source apportionment, so evaluating the sources of PM that were collected, and this is all PM 2.5. So if you look at cooking area, this is cooking area concentration. This is an outdoor. Um, the red is solid fuel combustion. So we do see that solid fuel contributes to a lot of the PM that is inside of the home. But in a lot of these settings, including rural settings in India, it's not even making up the majority of their PM exposure, their PM concentrations inside of their home. So things like solid waste burning, um, mobile sources, cooking emissions, dust and soil, all of those are really important sources in these settings as well. And I think, you know, we're trying to think about ways to account for a lot of those sources. And I, I'd be open for discussions with people about, particularly from a, a health a health outcome standpoint, you know, EPA, people from EPA, EPA has switched to much, a much more, I think, holistic view of prison composition, but they also have huge data sets. And so a lot of us tend to have much smaller sample sizes and observations. 
And so trying to do multi-pollutant modeling um, becomes a lot more complex in some of these settings. I think there's a lot of work to be done to think about how we can, at least on the statistical analysis side, account for these complexities of pollution settings. Uh, last, I think this is the last slide. Um, so uh, in terms of the outcomes and the impacts of this study, uh, so we have a lot of data that are, have been collected in these three regions at four time points, and we actually just got funding to extend the cohort for another five years and add PM composition analysis to that. So we'll be able to look at exposure response relationships uh, between air pollution and, and cardiovascular disease outcomes. Um, but I think probably the more exciting part of this is the fact that we have a large number of uh, blood and urine aliquots and dried blood spots to try and look at. Um, it's, this is still a really small sample size for a metabolomic study. Um, so if people, other people are collecting these kinds of data, it may be opportunities to, uh, you know, combine data and see if, you know, there's something more interesting that can be found with larger data sets. Um, but at least trying to get some of the idea about the relationship between the levels of exposure or even the sources of exposure and what that means um, and how we can better measure that in these, these settings. And I think that's it. Okay. All right. And I'm happy to answer questions so I know we're tied on to follow up with people afterwards. Thank you. Thank Question. I have a, one quick question. Um, on your uh, source apportionment slide, you showed at least one setting that looked like it had a high um, cooking emissions. Um, was that where people heat up oil and the oil spokes? So, um, if you go back, orange bubble, I think it was. Two, the two personal exposure studies, if you're referring to those, those are actually our studies from China. And in China, cooking, I mean, this is something that I think about all the time. Like, I'll talk about it in a bit. We have a stove um, study that we're working on as well. And I'm like, you should just put in a fan. Like, I mean, and, and, and there is evidence, at least on the, the, the side blank. Um, you know, there's been studies from Shanghai and other places that there's an increase in cancer incidence without using a vented stove. Uh, in, urban area. So that's one of the, the um among non-booking women, that and having a husband who smokes is those are two big predictors of your uh of lung cancer. So um so yeah, I, I think in those kinds of settings and certainly in treatment <coughs> missions or any place where they're like flash frying, right, without a, a vent, it's a huge source of, of PM. Um and there's lots of I mean I will point to Mike because Mike's the you're the source of pushing an expert in the the room right now, but there's a lot of, a lot of junk in that. <laughs> okay. So from your fuel recollection survey, what's the natural time to stop using solid fuel from introduction of Clean cooking fuel. Do you mean time? So, oh, yeah, I assume yeah. that this nobody was pushing anyone to introduce clean fuels or to see solid fuels. So, what you have is a record of what happened naturally. What is that? What is that delay time? So, part of the challenge <laughs> in China is separating. Um, in some cases, we have people that that have like at a, at a household level made that on their own. But it's China, and so in a lot of cases, it's that there's a huge biogas facility that um, was built down the road, and so they all were allowed to opt in, and everyone in the village made that decision. And so I, you haven't, we haven't looked at those data in, in great detail, but I'd say in most cases, it was, you know, some large-scale program uh, that was by the government to provide clean, clean fuel. And, it, you know, the shifts are to biogas, um, uh, natural gas, and, and LP. Not electricity in general because of the way that people talk. But. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jill, for your presentation. And now we're actually going to um, hand over the moderation to Terry Dean from EPA, who's going to be moderating a session to share insights from EPA's STAR grant program. Sure. I won't take much time, and we'll we'll kick this off. I just um, we'll have now have a series of shorter presentations 
um, from the PIs from a set of six projects that uh, EPA has funded. The focus of these is really on quantifying the health and, and climate benefits of um, cooking cook stove kitchens. And uh, these projects are ongoing. Um, many of them are at their midpoint uh, right now. And but many of them, many of what you'll hear about is not only um, uh, insights from our projects that, that we fund, but insights from other work that, that these PIs are, are, are doing uh, from, from their work. And so without further ado, just I'm going to turn it over to Rob Bayless, um, who will give the first of our presentations. Great. So these are shorter. How much, like 10 minutes? What, what do I have? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll wing it. Um, so thanks, Terry, and uh, everyone else uh, who's here. So this study, um, in some ways, is the work from Bangladesh and Nepal that Julia just presented, um, with a couple of key differences that I'll highlight as I go through it. I have a, a long list of co-PIs here. Hopefully you can scan while uh, Terry was doing the introduction. So I'm not going to go through them since uh, it's a short presentation. Um, I'll just jump right in and, and review our objectives, and I'm assuming everyone is more or less familiar with the, the overall RFP that this award was, was granted under. Uh, so we have three key objectives here. Uh, the first is to assess the availability and acceptability of different stove technologies and fuels in two different Indian states, and I'll uh, tell you where we're working in a minute. Uh, then experiment by varying stove price and what we're now calling exchange policy. Uh, that's not how we it, but uh, we switched on the fly, and, and I'll I'll explain why we did that as well. Um, so different exchange policies among users to see how they affect uh, these three key outcomes. One, adoption, which is the focus of this talk, and you know the whole reason we're here today. Uh, and uh, other key outcomes like fuel consumption and emissions and exposures as well, which I'll just touch on briefly. And, and as Terry indicated, we're just about halfway through. So all of what I'm reporting here is, is interim. Uh, and then thirdly, we're, we're modeling the impacts of stove adoption on climate uh, through a range of scenarios that are informed by data that we're collecting from the field. So we're actually collecting empirically emissions data and then we'll feed that into on the model, you know, under some time, some kind of scenario where you know, there's widespread adoption well beyond uh, just our, our uh, project participants. I guess we're working in two different Indian states, uh, one in the far north in Himachal Pradesh and one uh, in the south in Karnataka. Um, we have uh, local NGOs as co-PIs that are our gateway into the communities where we're working. Uh, there are four communities in each state and uh, uh, 60 participants in each community, so for a total of 480 participants. Uh, which is factorial study design where we're studying those two key uh, variations of, of price and exchange policies, and it looks something like this. So in uh, two communities, this is a two by two matrix we represented. Um, exchange policies, we have a one-off, sort of like a typical stove intervention where you uh, provide a, a stove technology or a fuel technology, and that's it. They either take it or they don't. Okay. In the others, we're allowing, well, if I wrote here, quarterly exchanges. They're actually a little bit longer than that, uh, more like six to 12 exchanges, um, where we offer a range of technologies, and then we go back six to 12 months later and we say, hey, would you like to switch? Would you like to try something else? And I'll, I'll show you the range of offerings in a minute. So half of the communities get a one time, and half the communities get the option to change. We're also offering uh, different price policies. We're not varying the price on a scale. This is not a willingness to pay assessment. It's basically a binary. Do we see a difference in outcomes if people are offered stoves for free versus having to pay for them? And this tries to test this notion that we give people stuff for free. They don't value it. They don't use it. And this has been to other kinds of interventions. You know, uh, the, maybe the most well-known one is malarial bed nets, anti-malarial bed nets, um, water filtration technology. Um, so we thought this would be interesting to also test for the, uh, the uh, household energy uh, intervention as well. Okay. And then, like I mentioned, we have uh, 60 participants. Uh, we're splitting them um, with 50 uh, interventions and 10 controls in each community. We're pooling the controls because our communities are more or less uh, similar in, in other regards in terms of socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera. So, you know, with well, possibly some methodological objections from people, we're, we're considering it a single control group. 
Uh, the stoves we're offering this is a very similar array of stoves that you saw in the other South Asia studies uh, that, that Julie presented, um, with two key uh, differences, and that is the more aspirational technology. So originally, we, we envisioned this as a study almost identical to Julie's, uh, where we were thinking, okay, all of the wood stoves that are available, let's, let's, let's see what's there, and let's see what people like. Okay. And then sort of at the last minute, we said, ah, you know, what about LPG? What about, what about even electric? Because we realized these communities are largely electrified. <laughs> um, and, and during our first scoping trip, we were surprised to see a couple of in induction stoves that had already made their way into these communities. So, yeah, what the heck? Let's do it. You know, it would be more interesting. There was a long delay in getting them funded together. So, uh, it gave us a lot of time to sort of think about redesigning the study and, and putting these in. And as you might uh, uh, imagine, it had pretty dramatic effects on what people did. So just a, a quick timeline. Um, we did our preliminary stove dissemination last year, um, and we held what, what we originally called bazaars, where we brought everyone together and sort of demoed the stoves and allowed people to ask questions. Um, and we took our baseline measurements, uh, both in terms of household air pollution and in terms of uh, social demographic surveys. Um, we did, allowed our first switch outs over the past year, looking at two different well separated locations. Uh, so the first one occurred last spring in Himachal, and the other one, just coming from literally, landed last night uh, in Karnataka. And the next switch out will happen sometime about, well, four months from now in Himachal, we think three to four months, and then about six, six or seven months from now in um, uh, Karnataka. Okay. All along, so we're doing incremental uh, surveys and, and uh, air quality monitoring, and all along we're doing still use monitoring. So that's been, they've been installed since 2015. Okay, uh, so you know, throwing a visual, this is one of our um, uh, field staff doing a, a survey in Himacho. And uh, in a sense, um, there was a fair amount of stacking in Himacho and in Karnataka less so. So I'm going to go over the, the interim results more from Karnataka just because it's cleaner and easier for us to interpret. And you know, we're in the midst of it, so rather than give you stuff that we're going to change dramatically by the time we do a full analysis. I'll give you stuff that I'm pretty confident in and we might only change a little bit by the time we have our full analysis. Um, so in Karnataka, this is what baseline stove ownership looked like. These are relatively poor communities. Himachal is a little bit wealthier, which is maybe why we see more stacking there. Um, so 100% biomass use, a little bit of kerosene in a couple of households. Uh, two out of the 240 had LPG as well. One was a, for a semi-commercial application, a little chai shop. Um, so, very, you know, sort of uniform baseline. And what people opted for, the red is LPG. So, only LPG with some key variation, okay? A little bit of induction, that's uh, um, purplish, and then, um, you know, a couple of solid fuel stills, um, but really a minority. So, we have so if you lump the aspirational stoves together, the electric and the LPG, over 80% uh, went with that option. This is at the first round of decision making. Okay. So among the three, that maybe makes sense, but we, we were really curious. We we gave a constant level of subsidy, so off based off the, the retail price of the stove, and with LPG that includes a whole package. You get you put a deposit for the, the cylinder, you have to buy the cylinder, the regulator, and the, the stove itself. Um, so we proportionally subsidized everything at a constant level. So the prices were, were lower than they would be if people had to acquire them at retail, but also still scaled so that they were scaled to the retail price. So gas was more expensive. So we thought, these are really poor communities. You know, would they opt for that? Would they be able to pay it? And we only offered a one-time pay. We didn't, we didn't offer a, a staged payment. And clearly, uh, they did. And, and we found no real difference between the free and the paid in terms of acquisition. Bump the average. Um, so we do find, however, um, well, okay, so I just said no real difference. We do find a little bit of a, of a variation, sorry, um, between uh, wealth is measured by a, a wealth index. So um, people do, the wealthy communities did tend towards um, gas and electric, the poor ones not so much. But that's all that, that uh, has changed when we offered the switch out. Okay. So people want aspirational stoves and fuels. This is not terribly new, um, but do they use them? Okay. So like I said, we are doing uh, surface monitoring, but we haven't analyzed that data yet. But one way we can look at this is just by looking at cylinder refills. Because this is a regulated market, 
gas itself is subsidized at the government at the at the level of the national government, so people have a little passbook um, that, that they carry, so we can actually see you know evidence. We don't have to rely on recall. We can see evidence of, of gas consumption, not so much for electricity. That's a, that's a different story. Um, so after nine to ten months, uh, near, nearly everyone who had who chose out has used it, okay, which was stark contrast to the the Ghana example, right? Um, and 66% have refilled it at least once. Okay. So that indicates you know, the majority are not necessarily using it all the time for every meal. Certainly not. But they are using it. Uh, and they are investing in its continued use. Okay. The refill, notably, these are, these are you know, rural communities. They, they, have to, they don't have gas uh, distribution <laughs> right on site. Right? So the refills usually include, unless it's the family itself has a, has a, a motorcycle or another vehicle, um, 50 to 100 rupees for, for transport. Which is essentially the subsidy. It's only about 100 rupees per cylinder. So they're, in effect, paying the same price as in an urban area when you factor in the uh, transport. Um, however, we find that wealthier households are consuming more. So we do see that. Uh, and that's evident. Yeah, this shows you the you know, box plot, so we're looking at the median, and you see a step up as you shift from one wealth quartile to another. Okay, that's a two minute. Okay, so what about induction stoves? It's clearly a second choice after LPG, popular among people who, who voiced wariness of LPG. So this, this safety factor, this narrative that LPG can be dangerous, it's, it's present here as well. Um, some barriers to induction, you need specific pots. We did supply them, but we didn't supply a pot for every cooking unit. So we gave these little packages uh, that included two or three, um, you know, sort of common pots, but, but it didn't cover everything. Wiring can certainly be in, in, insufficient, um, it's not necessarily the, the safest in wiring, and, and many households couldn't handle even a, a low wattage, relatively low wattage induction stove. Um, power outage is common, either announced and rationing or just unannounced um, blackouts. Um, and notably, 55% of the households that did choose induction did not use them, which is really in contrast to the, to the apportionment of, of LPG use. Um, only 30% use them regularly, and 90% on the first offer changed the LPG. It was not the choice for that. Okay, so some key lessons. Um, people want LPG or electric stoves, but don't use them for all tasks. And what we're finding out would persist, would use persist for a number of uh, reasons. Heating was uh, only in Himacha, which is uh, in the Himalayan foothills. Um, water heating for bathing, which actually occurs in both locations. Even in, in South India, which is relatively warm, people still heat up water for bathing, more or less for most of the year, not a seasonal thing. Um, and then some staples, and uh, staple uh, in the lower right, Various kinds of roti, which are, you know, very all around India, and everyone has their own style, but uniformly they prefer to cook them with wood. This one actually goes, this is from the north, this one actually goes in the fire. Um, uh, cooking animal feed, which if, if the household owns livestock, then that's a factor. Um, and then specifically <laughs> cultural practices, uh, wood, even dung, are considered to be ritually pure fuels, and foods with certain ritual uh, meaning must be cooked with wood or dung. Awesome. Unless they don't. Cities people don't do this. But in, or, in rural areas, they do. <laughs> okay. Um, and we thought chin is much more prevalent than we initially thought. 60% of the households in Karnataka, in our, in our study, have a chimney of some sort. And looks uh, like the one on the, on the right here, on the upper right. Um, and we found just to, with our baseline PM measurements, 60% lower uh, PM concentration in households that have chimneys versus households that did not. So really a significant factor. And Potentially, you know, you know, laying it out as we haven't really fully analyzed things yet, as big an impact as stacking with LPG, possibly bigger, you know, the, just the presence of the chimney. Okay. So, um, so LPG, uh, sorry, induction is clearly a second choice, except in cases where people already had, sorry, inductions are a second choice, except where people already had LPG, and then that was the primary choice. Um, and there are people who are specifically concerned about LPG safety. Um, Few houses, if any, wanted improved wood stoves, and those who did, didn't want to keep them when offered a, an option to change out. Okay? So nearly everyone changed, and one exception was, in Himalaya, we offered an improved heating stove, which you see here, really high-end stove, comparable in price to an LPG connection, and, you know, with a, with a place with a heating need where they also could cook on it half the year, uh, this was a popular choice in Himalaya. But still, largely among houses that already had LPG. Okay. So what about the other results, these outcomes that we're interested in, you know, in, in addition to adoption? Just very briefly, um, we, we do see a decrease in PM concentrations in intervention households in Karnataka, but 
you know, across the board not dividing out by different skill type, although the majority chose LCG, right? Um, so we do see a significant decrease pending further analysis. Um, and in HP, we see a difference in particular matter between LPG and non-LPG households post-intervention, okay? Um, and we also see it in uh, wood consumption only in two of the four communities between baseline and intervention. But we're, we're looking more, more closely into this. Um, there's a lot of stacking that's it's, it's messy. Next steps, we're going to return to HP for the next switch out in a couple of months. And we have a lot of data analyzed. We're doing social network analysis among participants. Um, we're doing climate modeling. Uh, uh, postdoc who's responsible for climate modeling is here. Uh, we're doing kitchen performance tests across the board. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of quantified, uh, a lot of quantifying to do with uh, the sums data, uh, our, our socioeconomic surveys. And we even have an access to ethnography in some of the communities. Uh, no, I think. This is especially uh, call uh, attention to our, our amazing field staff. This is uh, Patrick and Grishma on the top and bottom, respectively. Probably putting a, one of Andy's probe into a, a stack uh, on somebody's roof, and uh, Grishma mm -hmm. working with a micro on one of our um, participants along with uh, one of our field assistants. So, thanks for listening. Thanks, Rob. I think that. We'll just keep going if if we can and save questions for for um, for the discussion period at the end. Um, and next up, um, I want to turn things over to Tammy. Um, and I don't think you have slides for your presentation. So um, Tammy Bond from University of Illinois. All right. Hi. Um, I, and I don't have any slides because we are not working on adoption. So many of these ETA grants were about physical characterization of emissions, and, um, and our particular focus was on uh, some measurements, but characterizing the household as a system. So the way we came at this was people don't think of particular devices, they don't think of a cook stove, they think of how to meet their needs. And, um, and so I just, I don't have much to say that would be relevant to adoption, except that what we observe when we measure all the fuel use is um, is that uh, households have a large number of needs, and I think this will not be news to anyone. The cook stoves that we're supplying don't meet all those needs, and I personally I understand the notion of stacking, but I don't actually think that anyone is truly stacking. People are using different devices to meet different needs. Um, and nobody's using the same device uh, or the two different devices to meet the same need. So I don't, I don't actually see a stacking. I see the house more as a bundle of streams that they need to fill. Um, and so we, we found uses that we were surprised about. We went in particularly trying to characterize heating needs by, uh, by doing the same fuel use measurements in different seasons in Nepal. Um, what we did find was that there were indeed seasonal needs, but some that we didn't expect. And so, um, so I just I, I want to bring that up that I don't even think about adoption anymore until we've sort of characterized the household needs and then tried to match how would one fill those needs with what could be supplied. Um, and so I'm I'm more interested in covering the entire space of needs with a variety of solutions. Um, one thing I do want to bring to the group who's thinking about adoption, I don't have numbers on this. I have only observation, but I, I want to raise the notion of moderating technologies and moderating needs. Um, and so uh, the best way to illustrate this is through an example. You might have a stove that you like very well for cooking a meal, but if you also have another need that is uh, large cooking for any reason, whether it's animals or festivals or whatever, and you, you have that continuously being used, and by the way, this also includes income production, then that stove is in constant use, and it sucks away the use from the other cook stove you have in your house because you're already cooking. And so it's, it's almost like an, an attractor, right? Well, you, you have to do this thing. might as well do the other thing at the same time. Um, and so I think rather than thinking about why are people not using this one thing, we need to talk about how we're covering the needs that they have.
Thank you, Tammy. Um, I, I think what I, I'd like to do, just uh, just out of fairness, to everyone, is just keep going, and then we'll we'll come back to these discussions. So, uh, are you okay with no effects? Oh. oh, okay. So you want two minutes of discussion? <laughs> so, so we're 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 waiting for um uh, uh for for presentations to load. So uh, we we now have a chance to ask ask and answer questions. Yes. Karin Troncoso from Pan American uh, Health Organization. Um, I'm really interested in stacking, and I, I think that sometimes you you will find that people use different stuff for the same purposes, and sometimes they don't. Then it's either I think that there is a lot of need to to really recognize what are the difference and why people are using sometimes the, the, the different stuff for the same. But what I think is that stacking is not that that bad as we think sometimes. I, Sometimes when you have like different uh, technologies or when you are, with people is already using something new, uh, we have, I think that we have to take in mind that adoption is a process and then it's very important for people to try different things and chances are that if their circumstances change and they can afford to, to buy the, the, the food or whatever, then they are going to use it more because they know how to use it. They are like introducing the, this notion in their houses and in their cooking practices and that's good. And, and chances are that their children are going to use it more clean food if they are already using it. Then I think that sometimes we, we are like uh, thinking about stacking up the evil. And I know that for the health purposes and the, the I mean, the, what you want to achieve maybe is not that good, but we have to keep in mind that we have to, to, to push the process and to, to help adoption in, and that's something one at the time. Um, interesting discussion whether, oh, thank you. Julia Rosenbaum from SHI 360. Thanks. Um, a really good discussion, uh, whether it's stacking or not, and not to dismiss that. I mean, clearly we, we households need various, you, there are various stoves for different needs, and we look at ourselves, and not to, but look at ourselves. You, know, you have your toaster oven and your microwave and your stove stove and a barbecue and maybe a rice cooker and a tea. And as your economic situation, you're going to be expanding them. The one slide I didn't go into, though, that um, was really important in our study was we found that people were bringing outdoor activities indoors on the improved stoves, but they were probably, we didn't, I have no data for you, but they were most probably exposing them themselves to, to the much more, a much higher level. So things like the liquor and the animal feeds, things that are outdoor activities, big, time-consuming. They thought, oh, I got this great new stove that can do it quicker and less fuel, but in fact, they were getting a much greater hit uh, on the activity. So I think we need to start looking, measuring in some way at that. Too. <laughs> so that's fine. Let's let's go forward. So so next um, we'll go to Christine Wiedemeyer. Press it and let it wait. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm Christine Wiedemeyer. I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and actually I'm representing other people today. Mike Hannigan, who's in the project, and then I also point out here specifically Katie Dickinson, who's in the field right now, and then our partners at the Navrongo Health Research Center, which is a, a partner research center um, that um, I don't know how far it is from Contempo, but actually our partners were there last week. Um, um, so... Uh, we are working on a project called Reacting, which is the research on emissions, to air quality, climate, and cooking technologies in northern Ghana. And we've had funding from both the EPA and the National Science Foundation. Oh, sorry. Um, 
We are, our study is located north, uh, northeast of where Cantampo is on the border of Burkina Faso. In northern Ghana, um, we're based out of Navrongo, which is a town in the center. Um, the whole district, uh, the population of the districts where we work is on the order of 160,000 people. Um, it's about 20% urban, but um, we are focusing on rural populations with um, first, and then we have an additional add-on to look at urban populations. Um, God, I'm sorry. So our intervention, we are looking at um, two different stoves, the Phillips Force Draft stove, and then also a wood stove that we made um, in conjunction with a GIAPA um, that's made in Accra and in the south. Um, we designed uh, as part of the project. And we have 200 households that we're working with across the region. Um, we have them divided up into four groups. Uh, each group is given two stoves. Um, one group is given two of the Giapa, the wood stoves. One is given two of the Phillips. One group was given one of each. And then we had a control um, that were given a choice of two stoves at the end of the study, which actually just occurred um, in the last six months or so. Um, I'm specifically talking here about um, our assessment of adoption and what we've been doing to evaluate that. Um, the project has many, many different components from really quantifying emissions, doing exposures, um, looking at outcomes, uh, looking at regional uh, air quality impacts. Um, but uh, we've done, a, it was a two-year project. Um, we did a baseline survey and then quarterly surveys for two years towards the end of the project. Um, as part of that, Katie Dickinson also led a discrete choice experiment at the beginning to find out what people valued in their stoves. Um, we also have stove monitoring on the stoves across the study. We're doing microenvironment monitoring or monitoring of air pollutants within the kitchen area next to the stoves. We are doing PM and carbon monoxide exposure. Uh, monitoring. And then um, what's really nice is we have really great mathematicians and statisticians working with us to really help us identify some of the driving variables um, determining adoption, use, exposure. Um, so these are just some results. This is a pretty high level talk. We're happy to talk to people in more detail. But And these are just the results from the first year. Um, traditional stove, the three stove uh, usage group went um, down down the beginning of the study, but then rose again, that's in the black. Um, however, the use of both the GIAPA and really the Phillips declined over time, and we're still assessing a second year um, data set, but that's just after the first year. Um, these are uh, results of our stove monitoring and surveys. Um, can I use this? Oh, I guess not. So if you can see here, the control group is that show? Oh, oh, it's delayed. Um, the control group, or the three stones uh, group, is on the right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. Um, and you can see uh, from the surveys, about 100% are using the traditional stoves in the control group, which is expected. Um, our Stove use monitoring is a little bit less just due to challenges associated with the stove use monitoring of three stone stoves. But you can see that on the left is the GIAPA stove. Are you doing that? Oh my gosh, okay, right on. Um, on the left, <laughs> um, for the GIAPA GIAPA group, we got almost 80% of the time they were being used. Um, and, you know, so our maximum adoption or use of those stoves were about um, 55 to 70 percent of the time, um, whereas the Phillips use was much less um, on the order of 25 to 45 percent of the time. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking to my um, – and, of course, this was discussed in a lot of the other talks. We're seeing similar results that specific stoves and fuels are used for specific meals. Um, like KP mentioned, in his area, uh, Banku and another dish called TZ is commonly used. And what we found is that people are very reluctant to use the smaller stoves because these meals require um, a lot of uh, 
I guess, stirring, and, and uh, there was a lot of feedback about the stoves of them not being stable and supportive enough to support the cooking of this tea bed, but they were more often used to cook vegetables and rice and quicker burning fuels. Or um, we are doing a whole host of this measurements that I talked about, um, from exposure monitoring to uh, indoor microenvironment monitoring to ambient background monitoring, and we're using a whole host of different uh, statistical and mathematical techniques to really help us identify the sources of the pollutants and um, the exposures, understanding what's driving the uses. But what um, we found is really valuable is we can use the exposure measurements and the microenvironment measurements to really help us confirm and understand more about the stove usage and adoption. And this is just an example on the upper upper left is the exposure measurements of carbon monoxide for the four different groups, and then the cooking areas on the lower left or lower right. I mean, um, you can see the cooking area really provides us a strong idea of when and how those stoves are used. Um, and depending on the stove, you get different behaviors, different stove uh, timing. Um, however, that is not corresponding with what we're seeing in the exposure. So it indicates a couple of things to us. One is that, as Jill mentioned, people are being exposed to sources other than a cook stove. Um, and so it's really important for us, at least from the health and exposure studies, to really understand what is driving the exposure and what contribution the biomass burning has to those exposures. Um, the second is that we think that these stoves are altering the behaviors around um, cooking and driving some of the exposures. So there's really, um, I think, some interesting dynamics between the stove, the behaviors, um, exposure activity. Um, so just a few key findings. Um, again, adoption of the Phillips or the use of the Phillips was around 25 percent and the GIAPA with 75%, these are the results from the first year. Um, we're going back to assess a second full year. Um, replacement of traditional stoves at most was 25 to 50%. And, um, and again, I, this was a discussion that we've heard often today is um, people might like the stove, but that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they're using it. Um, a, a lot of control groups chose to have the Phillips stove, even though we're finding that the use is really, really low. Um, again, meal prepare drives the stove use. It's the same with um, that was just mentioned in the last talk. Uh, and then um, we're finding that the use of the intervention stoves decrease over time. And um, and then I really wanted to mention and highlight. Um, so our, our study has come in different phases. Um, there is, Katie Dickinson is working with Abraham Odoro at the Navrongo Health Research Center um, on a, a project that's just getting started now called Prices, Peers, and Perceptions, really getting at some of the interactions that's driving stove adoption use um, distributions. Um, and, and so that is going on now, and that's, they're all there right now working on that project. But, um, and I think that's it. Um, just got encouraging on how to use it. So that's good. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the uptake and use of a uh, semi gasifier stove in uh, the Tibetan Plateau in China. Um, oh, I actually started it out incorrectly. Um, so, this is a whole team of, of people that are, are funded on this, this EPA study. Um, uh, for this, what I'm going to be presenting, I particularly want to highlight uh, Sierra Clark, uh, who's a master's student. And um, when we initially put together, and this is a, an emissions, air pollution, health-focused study, um, and we had a small component that was on uptake and use, and she approached me prior to last summer and was like, I think we can scale this up and do it bigger. 
um, and really took the lead on this. So I'm, I'm uh, presenting a lot of the, the work that she did as part of that um, preliminary work. Um, so lots of people use solid fuel. The reason why I put this here is I just want to highlight that China, um, you know, China is the villages where we work, people have computers and internet access and cars, right? And they're still using solid fuel. And, and just to highlight, in China alone, there's over 40% of the population that's using solid fuel as their primary fuel. Um, you know, and I think all of us see this in our sites, that it's just not tracking with development is the same way as a lot of indicators that, um, that we look at for development. Um, our city site is uh, in Sichuan province. It's on the eastern edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, that's just a picture of the lab that we have uh, set up there. It's the best lab in the Tibetan Plateau that I know of. <laughs> it is. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, like, there is no, you know, one-size-fits-all stove. Oddly enough, in China, there kind of is a one-size-fits-all stove. This is the, the traditional cook stove in China. It's used for lots of different things, like cooking, cooking and heating and boiling water. It's pervasive throughout China. So if you move into northern China, eastern China, western China, southern China, which has huge variation in their climate and environment and the foods that they cook, and they all use that stove um, or some, you know, small iteration on it. So for the most part, uh, people are using uh, – that they, they have chimneys um, and usually open combustion chambers. Um, so the design behind this study is um, – or it included both evaluation of the design and development of a stove um, as well as – uh, implementation. So we do post, uh, pre and post uh, intervention measurements of air pollution, dual use, and health. Uh, we analyze all of those in the lab. Um, and then I work with uh, Christine in particular on some of the climate forcing impacts, air pollution emissions and exposures. And uh, similar to the study that I presented earlier, uh, my interest is in cardiovascular impacts. And in China, which has a growing burden of cardiovascular disease, it's, it's important to understand those, those predictors. Um, so on the left-hand side is the, the semi-gas fire stove uh, that's used in this study. And <coughs> I think when Tammy was talking about energy streams, I started thinking about where, you know, when we start thinking about streams, where that is the most important. And it's probably most important on the engineering side because there's a need for people when they're designing or developing interventions or thinking about, you know, whole, whole household energy, right? Um, they have to understand both what people are using their stoves for, but they have to also understand when you implement um, what's changing, and then, you know, can you adapt and go back and maybe change your, your whatever intervention, I'm using intervention broadly, um, so that it doesn't meet the, the needs of the community. And I, I have to give Tsinghua a huge amount of credit for this because this, the development of this stove was uh, a three-and-a-half-year process where they really were moving between the lab and the field. Um, and so this is the design that they came up with. And, the, the first goal is that it had to have low emissions. Um, so in the lab, it was a tier four stove. Um, and it, it needed to have a chimney uh, so that uh, it would vent outside of the home. Um, it has an automatic lighter, so it requires electricity. So you press a button, you wait two minutes, it lights. And then it has an adjustable flame. So you can cook at high temperatures as well as at low temperatures. Um, and then one of the problems is that, you know, with stoves, right, if you the walks are huge in China, um, and so you can't really, like, take it off to reload fuel. And so it had an automatic pellet uh, feeder so that you could you could add pellets and then crank it in if you wanted to cook for a longer period of time because you can't have people, like, taking these huge walks off. Um, the other part of this uh, is that the, the reason why a gasifier stove was studied in this case is China was promoting, continue to promote, as part of their national energy plan, pelletized biomass. Um, and but there's not a large number of stoves that can actually burn pelletized biomass. Um, so that was part of the the, um, the reason why that stove was developed. Um, and then at our village site, there's a, an energy demonstration project that's funded by the national government, which is a small scale village level pellet factory. And um, luckily, Pam basically covered all of the points about the challenges of these. So these sort of small-scale village-level factories and everything that she was talking about in terms of breakage and um, the scale and humidity, we see these, those exact same problems at our site uh, in China.
Um, I'm not going to say much about this other than to say these are the field emissions measurements that we did with the stove. So this is after the stove had been in homes for at least six, actually at least seven months. So it had been used for seven months. Um, it's a tier one stove for uh, uh, carbon monoxide, um, but for PM, it, it was a tier four in the lab and it's a tier three uh, in the field um, and compared with the traditional stove, which is a tier one stove. Um, and much higher PM emissions compared with the traditional stove. But still, I mean, that the PM that's emitted is still pretty high. Just in terms of where we are for this project, um, so we've done our baseline health measurements and, and air pollution measurements in 2014. Uh, in 2015, 125 homes uh, received the stove. We did post-intervention measurements last year. And then actually right now, the control homes are receiving the intervention and we're doing uh, additional measurements. So for the specifically, I'm only going to talk about the work related to stove use. Um, we have a questionnaire that's administered. This was administered last summer um, where we asked them about their current energy use practices. Uh, we asked uptake whether or not they even tried the stove. I, I will say uh, the uptake and adoption <laughs> definitions, we looked into this, and they're super confusing. It's all over the place. Um, and so we tried to stick with the literature to the extent that we can, but it, in this case, um, uptake was, did they even try the stove? Um, adoption and use was whether or not they were using it over a longer period of time. Um, and we asked about dishes that they used the, the stove to prepare, repair needs, et cetera. Um, we also used the temperature sensors. So we put, we did short-term monitoring of 48 hours um, in a large number of the intervention homes. And then we did longer-term monitoring for at least five months. Now we're getting into 10 months. Uh, and we'll be collecting those data this, this winter in a, a random subset of 20, 28 homes. Um, and then we use the sums data to evaluate the number of times that the stove was used each day and the duration of time that it was used. Um, so those are just a, this is to give an idea of, of who's in the study and who's not. Um, so we had about 125 homes that received the intervention um, and we had about 10% loss to follow up in our intervention we had a larger loss to follow up in our control group. So the reason for this is that we, this isn't randomized um, because we didn't have a large enough budget to randomize at the village level and we were really concerned about community air pollution. We had six villages, we chose three that got the intervention early or four that got the intervention early and two that we're gonna get it a little bit later. And as it turns out, there's just been a bunch of housing development uh, in the past couple years. These people have lived in their homes for their entire lives and a bunch of them up and moved uh, to the city in the past year and a half. So uh, we ended up losing uh, a lot of them and they were a larger number of them were from one village and that happened to be our control village, which is too bad. Um, so in terms of uptake, and again, this is, they let the people, let the implement put the stove inside of their home and tried it at least once. Um, it was around 89% uh, uptake, so people who tried it. Um, and then among those who had uptake, uh, it differed by wave. Um, so this is the uh, uptake among, um, or sorry, excuse me, adoption among the first wave. So this was in the fall. Um, we had 100% uh, that were continuing to use the gasifier stove at, at five months. Um, and in the second wave, which was when new batch of stoves came in, uh, there was a slight decrease. Um, that decrease, and I'm not going to get into details on this, but we switched manufacturers between the first and second wave and the stoves just started breaking at a much uh, faster rate uh, because of the lighter. So there is some problem with insulation that's been addressed now, but basically the first time people would use it, it broke. Um, and so that, that really is a lot responsible for a lot of that difference that we're seeing there. This is just a map of the homes, and you can see that we had um, the big homes are the green, no uptake are purple, and then the control homes are all in uh, spray. You know, we see some clustering of uptake by village. Some were in some, some village more common than others. We're looking at right now what are the potential other predictors of, of uptake in those. Um, so this is the proportion of days per month that the doves were used, both uh, pre and post intervention installation. So um, on the left hand side is the chinos, and this is the 28 homes that we monitored over the long term. Uh, we see some decrease in the uh, in the traditional stove use, but 
I mean, that's not statistically significant, and huge variability across those homes, right? So that's the mean, but the, but the story there is that the variability is enormous from all the time to, to never. Um, and the green here is the, the first wave, the purple is the second wave. Um, and the, the interesting story is when you look at the difference in use for people in the second wave who had the stoves that weren't functioning as well versus the first intervention group that had the stoves that were functioning much better. Um, I wish we could go back and actually implement the first version of the stove, but this is just the reality of doing this kind of work is that if you shift manufacturers, I guess that's the risk that I can take. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is just looking at the, uh, the difference that people are using at baseline, and that's on the right-hand side. Um, and then over time, as they shifted to different uh, stoves and fuel intervention. Um, and the main things that I want to note for this is that there was a shift to cleaner stoves and fuels, so other uh, fuels only, or other stoves only refers to clean stoves, so electricity, biogas, LPG. Um, so there was a shift uh, of people that aren't stacking, but then if you look at the control group, uh, it's pretty much the same. So we really don't see any difference between the control and the intervention group um, in terms of the number of households that are exclusively relying on what we would consider to be clean fuels. I'll skip over these. This is me because I, I put these in because I always get concerned about whether or not the measurements that we're taking – actually, I will take a second to talk about it. I always have, am concerned about Hawthorne effect, right? So are people acting differently on the days that we're doing measurements with the sums? And this is probably relevant for other people in the room, too. Um, basically, what we found is that uh, we did measurements pre and post. Uh, some measurements, we looked at the stove use before and after when we were actually there collecting the air pollution measurements, and we didn't see a difference in behavior. Um, when we were there or when we weren't there. Um, similarly, we wanted to know how uh, representative long-term – or the short-term measurement of 48 hours it is of long-term use of that month period. So this is the correlation in different seasons and with different stoves between um, short-term average cooking and a one-month average in cooking. Um, it's a small sample size, but we do get decent correlations. The lowest one is with the traditional chimney stove in her. Um, what we do find as a whole is that people are using the chimney stove much more often on the monitoring day than they are on the other days of the <laughs> Um as opposed to the intervention stove, which we get a much clearer relationship. And we're not exactly sure why, uh, but that's also kind of a bummer. Uh, and that we'll have to deal with that in the analysis. Um, so just to, to talk about our preliminary findings, and these are really uh, in the early stages. Um, the uptake of the semi-gasifier stove was high, um, but the average use was pretty consistent, um, so it was either consistently low or consistent with the second wave, with huge variability between homes and how frequently they were using it. Um, the quality of the stove appears to have at least some influence in the use. And then in the next steps as part of this study, we're going to evaluate uptake among the controls. We'll have um, longer, in, uh, more information on stove use patterns over a year. And then we haven't analyzed any of the, the focus of these EPA studies, for those of you who aren't aware, is really the air pollution component. We have lots of air pollution samples and emissions and health measurements that will be analyzed over the next year. Well, while I'm waiting for this, while I'm waiting for this to load, I can introduce the project a little bit. Um, once again, I'm an imposter. The, the PI for this project is John Vulcan um, from Clara State University. 
the good news is I actually work on this project. Um, <laughs> so I'm part of this, and uh, for the people who are listening or people who just arrived, I'm Michael Johnson from First Air Monitoring Group. Um, thank you. But you can, you can condense them. Okay. It's stuck on my screen, but Kevin is going to condense them with her. Um, and I, um, I took kind of a hybrid approach between what Tammy did and what some other projects have done. Uh, our project was very much focused on characterizing emissions and, and modeling things and, and not very much on adoption, but we did do some stove usage measurements. So I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce what this project was about, and then I have some connections to adoption that I'm going to bring up as well. It's, it's a, like all these projects, it's a big group of people, a lot of people recognize. Um, our main collaborators include Carnegie Mellon University, um, EPA, of course, uh, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, and then we have some field partners, uh, Creek in Uganda, Tsinghua University in China, Sri Ramachandra University in India. Um, we also have some collaborators at, at Penn State. So this project, the big picture question, um, again, a lot of this has to do with adoption, but perhaps it's interesting to some people here. Anyway, um, what can be done about the differences between lab and field emissions? This is a big topic that a lot of us have worked on, certainly something that I've worked on for a long time. Um, another component that we're looking at, what is the kind of big picture contribution from household energy to uh, air pollution and climate change all over the world. Um, and then what would happen if we're actually able to make uh, a large intervention with various technologies? What's going to happen to the climate? What's going to happen to uh, air quality around the globe? So those were the things that we were asking. Um, and so some things that we did, number one, we did a big uh, lab testing survey where we tested a bunch of different fuel of combinations. And we did this with an approach that we think is slightly better at replicating or at least um, pushing through stoves through a larger operating range that you might see in the field. So we tested a bunch of stoves um, in the lab. Here's a picture of one test testing stoves. Um, that was one big component. Another big component of this project was going in testing stoves in the field in, in four different locations. So we did field testing um, of emissions in Honduras and in Uganda, India, and in China. And when we did those measurements, we were measuring the um, emissions that were relevant for climate and relevant for health. Um, and you can take it to the typical stove down there. And we also did stove use measurements, um, because what we want to do is we want to try and connect some of those short-term measurements that we're making with longer-term stove use profiles. And, and, um, and the way we want to do that is, is by looking at the comparisons between what we have in the lab and the field. So this graph just shows the emissions that we're getting in the lab and the field um, and, and showing that they overlap a little bit better with our type of lab test. The yellow uh, box plot shows um, the firepower sweep test, which is what we use. And then on the left, you see this blue box plot um, of actual field emissions. And you see there's a lot of overlap there. Whereas if you look at the far right with the water boiling test, that's the green box, there's not a lot of overlap. It's got a much smaller performance range. So you're not getting that overlap. But by looking at the overlap in performance um, and connecting that with stove use, we think that we can get a, a better idea of, of how stoves are performing over time and a, a way to link the emissions performance we're seeing in the lab with uh, what we're seeing in the field. Um, so just to give an example of what I'm talking about to make this a little bit more concrete, we go and we make these measurements in the field uh, for emissions or almost, a, you know, any any detailed measurement of exposure or fuel consumption, those are short-term measurements, right? These are very, you can only do that for a few days, and maybe you repeat it a few times. Um, but what's happening in between? What's happening over the long term? Um, well, in this case, we did some very short-term measurements of, of emissions, and so that black uh, trace is black carbon, and uh, the blue trace is combustion efficiency. And then the 
would trace is the stove temperature, the stove use monitor response. And this is just a few hours, maybe six hours. Well, can we take really simple information that we can collect over a long period of time, which is that stove temperature, and can we connect that with, ooh, I hit the arrow button. There we go. Can we connect that with the long-term stove use profile, right? Um, because that's information that we can get for a long time. And what you see in the top graph is that stove use profile, it kind of corresponds, you can see little dips in the temperature when you get these events that are happening, when you get these spikes of black carbon that are coming out. And then you can look at the long-term profile of the stove, and you can see what its emissions are going to be like over a longer period of time. And you can see this a similar type of approach happening for um, air quality or, or other things that impact in a home. But taking the stove usage measurements and trying to extrapolate to a longer period where it's hard to collect all that information. Um, and this echoes what Tammy's been saying and what some other people have been saying as well. And I want to bring this here um, and give it an example. Um, so if we're going to address this issue of cleaning up air quality and addressing climate change, we need to think about all the sources in the home, think about all the needs that are, that are in the home. Um, you know, how are we going to address the whole set of needs in the home and, and the sources that we're seeing there as well? Um, and this is important. Um, for health purposes, right? Because when we look at the, uh, the emissions from the household sector, we know that there's a big indoor impact, uh, but there's also a, an ambient um, impact. And so some of the modeling that we've done is, is looked at what is the, the global impact from the outdoor contribution of these stoves. And so um, others have done this, and, and we get about 300,000, 400,000 per year is in line with other people have gotten. And we know that this is a problem, but it's not just from cooking. It's from all, all the things that people are doing in their homes. Um, and some of the things that people are doing in their homes also include things like burning trash, right? Um, uh, we know that this is an issue, but we don't know how big of an issue quite yet. And this is something that I know Christine's been working on quite a bit and some of the modelers at, at CSU as well. Um, so it has a climate impact and health impact as well. So we did some modeling based on the trash and the health effects there you can see based on some estimates of the modeling is about 250,000 um, yeah, 250, premature uh, deaths per year. And so we know that this is a big issue and again it's, a, it's something where we're thinking well what can we do about all these different sources, about trash, about lighting, about all these things, right? We need comprehensive solutions. Man. And then the last thing, um, just a few points to bring up. So, so the emissions that lead to these climate and health problems, they're, they're episodic and variable. We know this. I mean, the, the sources themselves, there's episodic and variable, and they can have disproportional contributions. Um, and just one stove can be on for a very short amount of time or be used for a very short amount of time and produce a huge amount of emissions. And another LPG stove can be on for a long time and produce almost nothing. Um, I mean, here's an example of a stove, and, and Jill might be interested in this. This is one of the biomass pellet stoves in China that we measured, um, and it, it's not the same one. That is, that's true. It's definitely not the same one. Um, but this is supposed to be one of the clean technologies, but we found that many times it was producing very high quantities of, of particulate matter, and so this is one of those instances producing a lot of organics. Well, how do we address those problems? How do we think about those these, these um, specific events and times and tasks that are producing disproportionate amount of, of the pollution and potentially the risk that people are, are um, exposed to? So anyway, just, just a few questions. Again, that study was mostly about characterizing emissions and, and, and modeling efforts, so it wasn't really directed at looking at adoption usage, but um, perhaps there are some interesting takeaways for the group.
Uh, so our, like others here, our EPA project does a lot of stove use monitoring, but does not uh, focus on an intervention or think too much about adoption. We do consider mixed use or stacking, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing um, at our field sites, what we're hoping to do to, to address what's happening in India and give you an update um, as current as I can think of on the status of Indian LPG programs. There's a lot happening and it's happening very quickly. So we'll start with that, LPG in India. Um, as you probably all know, about of the households in India cook with biomass, leads to about 10% of national mortality, um, and there's a lot of spatial and temporal heterogeneity in cooking activities, fuel use, stove use. You see lots of different fuels used across the country in different stoves. Yeah. Um, so the overall goal right now is to expand, skip some slides, hopefully not, um, let's go back. Um, expand access to around 100 million people for LPG. Now we know that access doesn't equal usage or adoption. So right now the big focus in India is on access. And we think it's a unique opportunity to try to accelerate the transition to clean cooking using health sector know-how. So what I mean by that is thinking about what we've done in water and sanitation with bed nets, with condoms, with low salt diets, that kind of thing, to try to drive adoption where we're seeing this big push get households connected to LPG. So this has taken a number of steps. I've split it into five or six. The first was Pahal, which just basically meant that they stopped doing the subsidy at the point of sale. It means that your subsidy went directly into your bank account, and that was to try to control leakage um, and prevent the subsidy from getting onto the black market. Next up was the Give It Up campaign, which was a large social marketing campaign to get the middle class to give up their LPG subsidy, which could then be targeted to below poverty line households. Now, below poverty line in India is a deprivation-based scale. It's a little hard to explain. It varies from state to state. There are between seven and 13 parameters that go into defining what a below poverty line household is. Um, but basically, you can think of it as less than 30,000 rupees per year, so quite poor households. Let's say 60 to 65 rupees to the dollar. So give it up. Uh, you saw if you were in India while this was going on, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing Prime Minister Modi's face somewhere talking about giving up your LPG uh, subsidy. There were Bollywood speeches, SMS messages, fairs, athletic events, kind of the whole gamut of social marketing techniques. They used the delivery boy to promote giving up the subsidy to wealthier households. Um, there's a website explicitly linking those giving it up to those receiving the subsidy. So you could go on, look up your customer ID number, and see roughly one-to-one -one where your subsidy was being retargeted. We don't know if that was real or a gimmick, but it was fairly effective. Um, and the overall message was based on health. It was making a poor man's kitchen clean. And to, to steal a line from Kurt here, he doesn't know many men who cook. So maybe that should have said making a poor woman's kitchen clean. Um, so around 11 million households have done so to date, um, and it was around 30,000 per day while this was going on at full steam. It's being wound down now. Next step was putting an income limit on the subsidy, so you were not eligible for the subsidy if you made over $15,000 a year, around 100,000 rupees a year. Um, so that, that happened. Uh, next up was PMUY, or what's called Ujwala, and this is the big effort to cover the connection costs which are around 1,600 rupees per household um, to pod line households. And so that total sum of that to date is anticipated to be around $1.5 billion. So it's a big sort of internal effort to redirect the subsidy, cover the connection costs for poor houses, and get LPG out to these uh, uh, poor rural communities. This is being expanded into what's called PMUY Plus or Jwala Plus. And in a Jwala plot, the goal is to beyond just BPL households, but to all households that are poor and still using biomass. So there is a thought that there are quite a few households that do not qualify as BPL but still use biomass, and PMUI Plus is seeking to reach those using a combination of government funds and privately donated funding. So that set of actions is basically there to address all biomass households, and again, it focuses on new connections, not adoption, uptake, usage, long-term usage fuel switching. 
So as I mentioned, we think there's a need to focus on facilitating increasing usage to get health benefits, and we want to apply learning from other health interventions where possible to this sector. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've seen in Haryana going back to about six years ago when we started working there and what the situation looks like now. Uh, it's evolving. It's, we've been able to watch it change in real time. So baseline, uh, the homes we work in in northern India, this is about 65 or 75 kilometers south of Delhi. You got four uh, main stove types being used. As someone else mentioned, you see this unique practice of sticking the bread in the fire. To cook it a bit, here you've got wood and dung, and all of these stoves are kind of used all the time, uh, depending a little bit on seasonality, and most of the cooking happens outdoors. So we did a study targeting pregnant women. Our, women, our thought was that pregnant women are the most vulnerable, poor pregnant women are the most vulnerable class, and so if you can get them clean cook stoves and get them to use them, you expect to see uh, potential changes in birth weight. This is a feasibility study in 200 households where we monitored stove usage on the traditional stove for between one and three months prior to intervention, and then monitored the intervention stove for about a year. Um, and the takeaway here is that at the study end, there was a lot of mixed use, and I'll just show you one summary figure from that study. So prior to the intervention, you kind of had all traditional stove use, of course, and this was only on the primary cook stove, not on all four of those stoves that we monitored over time. And then with the intervention, you saw it decrease over time and eventually stabilize. Traditional stove use stayed the same. So we think the quality or the amount of energy services provided were about equivalent to what you saw prior to the intervention. So you were seeing mixed use, um, but the stove was not used consistently or for a long time. It was used for specific tasks. And the big problem we think with this stove was that there was a lot of failure. The mean time to failure was extremely short. Um, by the time we got the stoves, Phillips had stopped making them in India and parts dried up. So uh, it, was, it was rough going. We did a lot of maintenance on the stoves, but at, you know, at a certain point, if you're having to fix it repeatedly, you just get tired of it and give it up, and that pour out from the surveys. So if you fast forward a few years, this is kind of more what we're seeing nowadays. You're seeing LPG cylinders. You're seeing electric stoves. There's between four and eight hours of power, depending on which village you're in. It's a very inefficient coil stove um, that's used primarily for heating water and simmering animal food. And then right outside of this indoor kitchen were two chulas. So again, a lot of mixed use depending on the specific need. And uh, uh, some of you have already seen this plot, but you know, again, just backing up the fact that there is a lot of mixed use. This is a random household from some recent measurements. And you see LPG use very sporadically. You see a lot of chula use, and then hard to interpret outdoor simmering stoves. Oh boy. Yeah, and we want to get to the point where we're moving open the simmering stoves and chula. Now I'm going to talk about a, a separate project that was motivated by a lot of this work in Haryana that's happening down south and outside of Pune. Um, and it's funded by the Implementation Science Network. And so we think there are two intervention points during life course points that are pretty important that could work as to target interventions, marriage and pregnancy. Um, we've been interested for a long time in using conditional cash transfers to encourage use of clean cooking. And so what we're going to do in Pune, or what we're starting in a couple weeks, is an evaluation of a program that simulates the Give It Up style program, where the connection covered to BPL households. And we're going to have, just three, there should be four, oh well, yeah, three pregnancy arms, a stove and connection fees only arm, which is what happens now. You can, if you're registered, if you are registered as BPL, you can get a free stove in some states and your connection fees are covered. You can, we're going to do a stove connection fee and conditional cash transfer, which means that we're going to pay for use, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then we're going to do a stove connection fee and free fuel. So we'll have some nice comparisons, we think, between a free fuel arm, an arm where you're getting paid for use, and then an arm where you just get the stove in connection, which simulates the national program. I was struggling with this. On. There we go. All right, so why a conditional cash transfer? Um, in India, this is fairly common. So cash transfers are directed to pregnant women for delivery in institutional settings um, for prenatal care visits. And so our idea is that if we can create a monitor that can be, let's say, plugged into your LPG stove and that you take with you to your antenatal care visit when you're already getting a cash transfer, you can enable uh, a pretty simple CCT. And so 
some of the nice things about the CCT, um, it's not open-ended. There are some education-based conditional cash transfers in India that are fairly open-ended. They go on for a long time. This one is constrained by pregnancy. Um, and we think we can, incentiv we can incentivize use of LPG via the CCT, leveraging all of our experience using um, stove use monitors. And so we've created a, a low-cost kind of purpose-built stove use monitor for this project. It's called a Pink Key Sums. Um, we didn't focus group that name. Pink doesn't really have any meaning in the Indian context around pregnancy or weddings. Red does. Um, red key sounds kind of awful, so we're working on a better name. But for the meantime, it's a pink key. That is a prototype unit. Um, it plugs into the front of the stove. Underneath the stove are two five-cent uh, thermistors that measure temperature that go directly to the burners. And that little gadget, um, rather than logging continuous temperature, apply some algorithms to get an idea of how many times the stove is used per day and accumulates that over basically a month. So again, the idea is that the woman can take this thing out of the stove, if she's trained to do so, go to an antenatal care visit, plug it in, and get between one and two rupees per meal for each meal that she cooks on LPG. Uh, that's a little bit less than what we've calculated as the per cost meal of cooking. So what I mean there is that we're trying to avoid perver the perverse incentive of just leaving it burning all the time and turning it on and off so you get some cash, which we are concerned about. Um, in addition to the pink key on all these stoves, we're going to have traditional eye buttons and we're going to be monitoring stove use using some thermocouples on the primary cook stoves. Uh, in this area, we're fortunate that there are usually, there's a primary cook stove in the house and then an outdoor simmering stove. And we're not too worried about that outdoor simmering stove for this project. We're going to focus on the primary cook stove and the intervention LPG. Happy to talk more about that if anyone's curious about what we're doing. I didn't mention too much the wedding arm. Um, turns out that identifying new weddings are pretty difficult. We're working on that part. And the idea there is to intervene at marriage because in these communities, between 60 and 70 percent of the women are pregnant within the first year. So we're hoping that we can catch the women before they're pregnant, get them using LPG, and have a longer number of pregnancy months where they're covered by a cleaner cooking stove. Whereas with a, where you're recruiting pregnancy through the antenatal care system, you're lucky to catch them before the end of the first trimester, um, so you miss a critical window. Some additional stove use monitoring related activities we have going on. We've got a machine learning tool that's now on the web. I'm sorry I didn't put the URL up there. Um, the cheeky name, sumsariser.com. And what, what you do there is you have a fairly large data set. You upload it to the web. You hand label about 10% of the data you upload. So you go through and you mark what you think is cooking, submit it to an ensemble supervised learning process. And depending on how large your data set is, within a day or a few days, you get back summary results of what's cooking and not cooking and some output on how the machine learning is doing based on cost validation. We have some simple tools to visualize some data easily, and I think those are available from the Alliance's website. Um, and we're working on some new sensors, including the pink key, to enable long-term monitoring for a variety of needs, including deployments where I buttons aren't appropriate and where you might be able to use some kind of radio network relatively inexpensively to monitor stoves from afar. Um, so that's, that's all I've got. I want to thank our Inclin and KEM teams who make most of this work happen. Um, and all the various funding sources that have paid for this work. Thanks. So I'd like to thank our, our presenters for um, doing a great job of covering a lot of information in a short period um, and putting us back, giving us some time for further discussion. So, um, where would you like it? First, um, I'd like to open it up for questions um, for the, the last six presenters, um, and, and then we can shift to some broader questions. I think everyone's kind of overwhelmed by all the information. So. Yep. Karin from Coso Pan American Health Organization. I just want to, to comment on Rob's uh, presentation. And I really like the approach you were giving to the to the whole study. And particularly I, I like that you try to prove if the given uh, the technology for free or given a subsidy 
was effective in adoption because it's something that we found too in Mexico and I am always saying that the adoption doesn't have anything to do with the fact that if people have to pay or not, it has a lot to do with the technology and whether it's appropriate for people and really it can make a, a, a difference in their lives. Then it's, I really like that approach. I have a question from the web. That's okay. Hi, this is Cecilia. I have one question from the uh, public chat, um, and it came right after Julia's presentation, but I think it's applicable to everybody. Uh, the question is whether, in general, we find that some data is excuse me, reflective of the oh, did we? I'm too sorry. Okay, never mind. Apparently, this has already been discussed. Oh, okay. <laughs> That was a question for Ajay. Um, on the last study, the ISN study that you guys are conducting, it makes sense that this is, yeah, um, that you are having trouble identifying marriages at the time to really make it work. Are you thinking then of just leaving that uh, group out and just focusing on the pregnancy in arms? And I mean, one of the reasons I ask is because there's a sample size issue too, and having not having that third or fourth treatment really able to use. Yeah. So um, we've talked about that. I, I, there are two wedding seasons typically in India, so we do think we're going to be able to do it. And we've kind of identified some marriage brokers, and so we're making progress on that front. Which is, yeah, I know. Um, it's it's so it's very strange, it's a very strange sort of intervention. But I, I think we're going to be able to get that, those number of households. So we have kind of scaled back our ambitions on some of the monitoring in the in the wedding specific arm. We're going to have all this abuse monitoring. I didn't talk about the household air pollution and personal exposure monitoring. We're probably not going to have any of that in that arm, but um, don't think it'll be too different. Hopefully. Uh, so the first wedding season is now. We're starting. We're probably just going to learn how to catch them now, and then we're going to catch them in the next season, which is in early spring. So we're not giving up on it just yet. Tom Clawson from memory. Uh, two questions. One uh, for Ajay. The, these uh, pink key uh, devices are. Are you? Can, do they have a way of protecting against cheating? I mean, of uh, using these things excessively, but not really, you know, using them for cooking. So this is our first attempt at using this kind of monitor. Um, so we are going to have thumbs as backup that we'll be analyzing kind of in real time at the same time to see what's actually happening. We haven't decided how we're going to deal with this at the point of payment, um, like if we're just going to pay them for all the use that the monitor records or not. Uh, so that's a good question, and we're still kind of working through how we're going to do that. And then just a quick question for Michael. Maybe this is uh, uh, obvious to everybody else, but is it what a chimney – uh, addition to a gasifier stove, for example, uh, likely have any different effect on uh, for, uh, of that stove on climate than one that doesn't have a chimney? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, it, in terms of climate, possibly. I, we actually presented some data earlier that showed that chimney stoves had slightly different particle size distributions from non-chimney stoves. I don't know if it would affect emissions from a, a pellet stove specifically. Um, uh, Tammy might have some ideas about this. I'm not sure. But. So I, can, I can only speculate. So 
um, if you're talking about black carbon, then it probably makes it worse by burning out the organic carbon. But I think there's a lot we don't know about the gases that come with incomplete combustion. So I'm hoping to see some results from these projects. I'm going to say ozone modeling again, Christine. Um, and so not to make this too complicated for people who aren't emission people, but there are various components of the emissions that go in different directions to the climate. Um, and we see that more complete combustion, uh, hotter combustion, has a different profile than low uh, or smoldering combustion. I think that's one of the things we have to sort out through these projects. There is a point at which it gets really good. Uh, the question is where it gets good before or after most of the stoves uh, are able to function there. Hi, this is Helen Pichak from USA. Jill, I have a question for you on that many of us have been very enthusiastic about the low emissions from pellet stoves. And it's a little bit disheartening to hear about the many issues in the production of these pellets. And I wondered if, in your opinion and experience, these are surmountable issues, that if we put a lot of effort into figuring out pellet production, would we just cruise past these and this would no longer be a hurdle? Or is this something that's here to stay with us? So I guess the, the first thing that I would say on even the stove side, so Michael was showing his the pellet stove that they were testing. So we've tested a bunch of pellet stoves. Other people have doing this, been doing this too. I mean, they vary between tier zero and tier four. So, and then I had gotten into fuel pipes. We were chatting about that. Like we, at our field site even, we were just testing out some of the, um, or the, the, the factory had, had done, rather than doing, using wood pellets, they had switched to biomass. Um, and it was like a, uh, a more straw type pellet. And like they dropped them off at the the factory dropped it off at the households and the households were within like minutes. And we're like, these are terrible. There's smoke all over our house. Like these are just not gonna work. And that supports what we see with variability on that side. Um so there's there's huge variability, like a gasifier is not a gasifier, is not a gasifier, right? Like they, they vary quite a bit. I mean, in terms of the, the village level or the pellet factories, I think both of us those sounded pretty small scale as well. Um Okay. I mean, it, that's, not, well, so my, my comment was going to be in China, there are large scale pellet factories that are doing really well. Um, there's been a few years in them, which is a challenge with the, the maintenance and making sure that you're storing all of the fuel correctly. And, um, and that certainly is a risk. But, uh, as long as you have that down, at least it, you know, the, the cost of, so our, the cost of the village level pellet factory fuel has varied quite a bit at different time points depending on the amount of maintenance that's been required. But you know the the ones produced at the large factory um, were produced at the at the um, smaller scale village level pellet factory. But that's not you know some of the transport issues aren't accounting into that. So I don't think it's necessarily time to like close the the book on on pelletized fuel, but there's just a lot to be learned in terms of like what scale, what location, what are the different parameters that need to be addressed in making it more uh, efficient production. Okay, so I originally had a question for Ajay, but I want to just follow up on this pellet thing too. So my, the other hat that I wear for research is, is more biomass energy, broadly conceived. Yeah, it's surmountable at scale, right? We export millions of tons of pellets per year from the Southeast US to, to Europe, and, and Europe itself makes another you know, lumps of millions of tons. It's a question of what well, Pam just wishes me on the side. It's a question of scale. No one's going to invest at that scale for, for community dissemination. You know, for a very long time until until the market is guaranteed to be there. So, you know, it's not a technical problem per se. It's a combination of you know, technology and and what kind of market you have. Right. So, um, for Ajay, the the um, conditional cash transfer thing is is super interesting. I uh, co-wrote a a failed proposal to do the same thing, and and the, my point is, and I really like sort of wrestled with how do you design this and, and mentioned okay you can you can monitor use and that's 
fairly easy and there's the moral hazard question. But the whole point is to reduce the use of you know, the dirty stuff. So are you going to penalize people for, for using dirty stuff or, you know, because you said you're going to sum the, the dirty stoves as well. Um, and, but that, that, that data is not being collected in real time. They're not bringing that information to the clinic. So what's your approach? Yeah, that's a great question and something we struggled with. So right now we are just collecting that information. We're not going to penalize continued use of the traditional stove. We're, you know, we're hopeful that we'll see that the provision of free fuel in one arm and the provision of the cash transfer in the other arm will be enough of an incentive to move over. So we're going to cover, you know, all of the difficulties with fuel and all. We're going to provide the right so they'll be able to get it fairly easily um, in those arms. And so we're hopeful that that will decrease usage of the traditional stove. I mean, I think more realistically, we're pretty sure that we're not going to see complete switching. We may not even see close to enough switching, but um, this is what we're doing for now. That was very similar to the question that I was going to ask. In general, these traditional cash transfer programs that I've seen, uh, so NextLeaf has one in, in India that they use that, that the use of a gas fire stove, and then yeah, here we have an LPG stove, and I think, um, I don't, have you guys done some with water filters? Has Evan done them with water filters? You know, similar, similar things like that. Looking at the improved technology, and what I'm wondering is a broader question is, um, these are strategies to increase the use of a new stuff. And we also have lots of other strategies. We have educational approaches. We have um, training programs. We have advertisements. We have lots of behavior change strategies to be very much focused on. Oh, this is good for you. This is good for you. This technology is good for you. There doesn't seem to be very much focus on the education or specific strategies to talk about Converse. I know it's maybe somewhat of a negative approach. And I, don't, I just don't know what the psychology of the approach might be, but um, I mean, it seems like this is the group to have that type of conversation about what types of coaches may or may not work for focusing on that displacement. Well, uh, regarding that, I would like to share with you the, uh, a study that we are doing at PAHO with different countries because what we have been doing is studying the different kind of subsidies that are in different countries for, and we have found very interesting data. Uh, the f first thing that I, I want, mm, I don't know if you know much about the, the differences between countries, but we have like, for example, Bolivia. That is a very, very poor country with a lot of indigenous people, and, and they have less uh, uh, use of biomass than Peru, that is a neighbor that has twice the GDP per person and, and more or less same uh, characteristics, or even less indigenous population. Then we were wondering what, what is happening. And uh, we found that the subsidies had a lot to do with these changes, particularly in Bolivia, for example, the LPG is like a fifth of the price of Brazil or Paraguay, for example. And then uh, we have seen, for example, Ecuador that has a huge subsidy to LPG, and they have almost none uh, population using biomass. Then uh, I think that that's very interesting because we are always saying that the, the cultural reasons and traditional uh, practices that are behind the low, low adoption so that, if, uh, that people don't change because of that. But we have seen that without any other uh, approach, without any educational uh, or campaigns or training or awareness or whatever, just giving economic access to LPG has been really very important in switching people to LPG. Uh, we have a, a paper that is almost uh, it's going to be published, but if anyone of you would like to, to, to have it, I can share it with you. Um, but it's very interesting because I think there are a lot of interesting lessons to be learned from these this cases. So. I want to pick up one question. I'll come back to you. Um, I want to pick up one question that came in from from folks on the web, and that was to ask um, anyone um, where solar 
fits into into the discussion. Any, anybody have a response? Yeah. Well, I, I can share the experience from um, from Ghana. The the point about solar is it's so very expensive and out of reach for the majority of people who will want to use the LPG. Um, to set up a panel in in Ghana to to run a whole maybe a house or four four rooms will require about ten thousand dollars, and that is way out of scope, way, way out of scope. We might think that we, we could scale it for, for heating and for uh, heating water and other things, but it's still out of scope. Did you have to ask that? Okay, then I'm going to go here. Thanks. Actually, you may be able to respond to the question I'm going to ask also. So, we're about to start a trial uh, where we need to ensure very high compliance over a period of time to be able to do a good measure of exposure and the potential health impact of lowering exposure to uh, acceptable levels. And what I've heard in pretty much every presentation this morning has been you, when you introduce new stove technology, you get a fairly high uptake at the beginning, and it sort of uh, falls off over time until it gets quite low. And a lot of the different projects have talked about the fact that it falls off and maybe why it falls off. But what I'm curious about is what you can tell us about how to maintain it at a higher level or what strategies work to keep compliance high. So one is the subsidy that Karen just mentioned. Another that seems to be cooking demonstrations, particularly focused on traditional foods that people think of as being slow cooking uh, in different places. So that came out of, uh, I think, Rwanda and Guatemala both. Uh, but what else do projects know about what can be done to keep compliance levels high? And I was thinking of, um, of your discussion about tips and what you learned from that and um, user-focused uh, design. But. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering, and, and maybe actually KP would be a good person to comment on this, because I think all of the studies that were discussed today are really more in the evaluation context, but I think more similar to the NIH trial, if you look at actually the work that was done in the three different trials, at least in Ghana, Nigeria, and in Nepal, um, in those situations where people actually had access to the fuels, um, it actually was not a problem to, to maintain very, very high levels of, of compliance. I don't know, KP, if you want to say a little bit more about that. In the graph study where we provided fuel, compliance was very, very high. I mean, you, you would go to a typical household and see the traditional stove almost abundant, that sort of thing. So access to the fuel is, is key and also maintaining the, the cylinders. Maybe a quick follow-up. What about this idea of different stoves for different uses and that uh, in, in the context of access to fuel, does that change as well? Or does that remain a problem that uh, people see different stoves as being good for different things and this pattern that a number of people talk about where introducing an LPG stove or a cleaner biomass stove didn't reduce the use of traditional cooked stoves, but just increase the use of fuel overall and increase the use of cooking. So maybe just to the earlier point, what I wanted to add was that it's so it's possible the supply of fuel is what's keeping people using these things, but it's also possible that the constant contact with people who are talking to you about your stoves is also driving that high take up or high usage. So I think there's you know, what we're hoping we can test and see in the Rwanda study as we do subsequent rounds of data collection is how much of an impact does this constant contact with customer service representatives have. Now, if it does have a big impact, then 
we need to think about how that could be brought to scale because I'm not sure that it's scalable, but maybe there are other sort of social network mechanisms that could be used that could leverage that possibility. I, I did want to say I like that idea, and I think that um, Ajay was talking about the delivery boys used in your study and the, that I didn't describe today, which is a, it's a gas stove behavioral intervention in rural Guatemala with pregnant women. Um, we provide them with a, a stove that Anaite mentioned is a very acceptable locally produced stove with a plancha that cooks the tortillas and a big um, fire to cook the um, large pots of animal food and mishtamal. Um, and then we provide a behavioral intervention. And one of them is when we deliver the free tanks during pregnancy is at the tank visit. We have very intensive focused behavioral messages that are in the process of being developed because we're not completed the study yet. But we think that that tank intervention is important. And we know the way tanks are delivered in a lot of parts of the world basically are on the back of the truck. They're unloaded. They're dumped at the front door. And every time they're out the door, there is no real maintenance, repair, sustained use, behavioral messaging that goes at, at that point of delivery. So it might be interesting to think about, about that. I, I have no answer to, to your question, but some comments. I think I mean, one is we don't have the product right yet, or the product right. We really have those yet that deliver what people are looking for. And I think you're not going to have sustained use have a, a better set of products for people that meet those needs. People have talked about this, but we have to look at the fuel stove dyad as well and and assure, again, a continued supply, easy supply, accessible supply of the, the fuels in one way or another, whatever that means, or the free biomass fuels are going to win out also every time. So with those two comments, I think um, I wanted to make one response to the new notion of using sort of negative messaging or negative approaches as opposed to more offering positive benefits. And then Michael sort of privately said in sanitation, for instance, haven't there, hasn't there been great success by shaming people uh, for open defecation that then forces additional and sustained use of latrines? I think versus the positive approaches, you're with any kind of fear approach, we first got a lot of data from HIV. Fear approaches, people might initially do some spark of a behavior change, but then it, they, it's a natural instinct to sort of push it as far as you possibly can. So it's smoking, HIV, and it's not unless, not until you pair fear with a call to action or with self-efficacy, something immediately that you can do. So if you can pair up the fear thing, but with sanitation, it was, you know, open defecation, excuse me, you're eating your own shit is how, the, that's how it goes, not that they ask and shit and whatnot. But, um, you're eating your own feces, and you can build a latrine. You have to have those so And so we have to think about how we will do that for the stove. Um, and that, again, you have to have the, the equation right, whether it's the four Ps or that the, the benefits are more than the, the cost of doing the, the behaviors. So we're playing with that equation. Well, just, just for us to underscore the point that cooking is very cultural, and therefore changing that cultural behavior, which is also very communal, requires a communal effort. So for most of our interventions where we begin to target individuals within the households, uh, we may have to rethink about it. I mean, targeting pregnant women, targeting women, target, we really have to think about those approaches to, to to enhance uh, the uptake of it. Um, John Mitchell from EPA. Uh, I have two comments. The first comment is I think we're, our community has been most successful in replacing stoves completely is the charcoal stoves in Africa where the Kenyan ceramic Jico has replaced the three stone fire and it's pretty ubiquitous and it's the new baseline. And oftentimes you'll see that people have improved charcoal stoves that are in the same shape, support the same pots, um, can be successful because people are actually saving money um, every day 
using those stoves. Um, another thing is, um, for me, really briefly, we used to think that somebody bought a stove and replaced the old three-stone fire 100%. Then we learned about stove stacking. Now we're learning a lot more that where people can afford multiple stoves, they do. We see this increasingly, and, and today was amazing to see all over the world that that's happening. And it points out to me that in addition to promoting the cleanest possible fuels, gas and electricity, we really need to work at the next layer below that, and that is trying to pick off the primary cooking task. Or, and that they have to pair them. And, and I think this is a new paradigm that we need to start to get heads around. And there's probably a lot more, and I'd love to spend all afternoon talking about where we are with this new paradigm of what are we thinking about as we go forward. It's, it can't just be... LPG is the answer. We know it isn't the answer. It is an answer we'd like. That's the answer we want, but it's not the one we're getting. So I think we have to think about really pairing with the sort of the next step below that and picking off the primary cooking task and maybe even a step below that and a third stove and just trying to figure out how to make it all work. Well, I actually had two, Terry. Am I allowed? Um, Tammy Bond University of Illinois. So the first thing that struck me, not just in the last of things, but all throughout the morning, was the notion of risk, that we're, we're dealing with people who, who don't have the capacity to absorb shocks and negative events. And, and sometimes we're asking them to take risks that we ourselves would not take. And I, I just want to raise the ethics of where we leave those people. Uh, that we have to acknowledge that if we want to explore going forward and going into this risky space, that we have to be repair, prepared to recover where they were, at least. Um, and then the, the second thing is, and, and, and I, I hope John will back me up on this, and, and, and then quite different, what we're seeing is that there's stark heterogeneity in fuels, in tasks, um, and in conditions. And for those people who are involved in recommending stoves and rating them, we rate stoves for doing one thing very well. And I think we should be thinking about stoves that are a little more robust, that can handle fuels uh, of, of maybe not so high quality. Um, and I think that we should give more points for being able to perform moderately under a range of circumstances than performing well under a single circumstance. So a great set of sort of summary closing comments, actually, um, some challenges that we have um, ahead of us. So I, uh, on behalf of EPA, I'd like to, to thank the Global Alliance for hosting us. I'd like to thank all the folks from USAID and, and that were, were funded by um, the Alliance and USAID programs and, um, and for all of you for, for participating. Yeah, and so I think with that, we can end the webinar. So thank you also to those of you who stayed on the phone and for those of you in the room as well.